The City Council Committee on Administration and Finance, co-hosted with the Committee of the Whole, is meeting in Council Chambers today, Wednesday, June 7th at 6 p.m. for the purpose of discussing fiscal year 2024 departmental operating budgets and associated capital plan improvement projects. This meeting is being held in City Council Chambers at 93 Washington Street on the second floor. Notice of this meeting was posted on May 31st, 2023 at 2.37 p.m. Members of the public who are unable to attend the meeting, the primary meeting here, may access and follow along using Zoom by entering webinar ID 826-8186-9351 and entering password 725-9888. Joining us tonight from the Committee on Administration and Finance are all members excluding Councillor Watson Felt. Joining us from the Committee of the Whole are Councillors Cohen, Orsillo, Dominguez, and Prosnowski. And it looks like we are starting tonight with our very own city clerk. Very exciting. So I'll, I'll give it to you the same way that I give it to everybody else over the last few days. Um, try to pretend you've never met us, which is a little tough because we see you all the time, but pretend you've never met us, go over what exactly the scope of work is for the clerk's office, let people know what you do, and then we'll dive into the numbers. My name is Eileen Silas, and I am the city clerk for the city of Salem. Um, thank you for having me tonight, and nice to meet you. So, so um, in the city clerk's office, we are divided into about three departments. There's a city council and city clerk, which involves most of our vital records, and then the elections office. And each of those um, departments are done separately for the budget and so the gamut runs from um, being um, attending the council meetings uh, and being the parliamentarian for city council we do um, keep vital records for birth death marriages um, all of the licenses and and obviously run all federal state and local elections Any, anybody have any questions on that? Okay. And what did you want me to, I'm sorry. Um, it's really up to you. Is there anything that you would like to highlight in your operating budget that may have been significant changes or things you would like us to be aware of? And then um, at your leisure, we can also hop into any capital projects that you sure. may have added. Um, would you like to do it by department as it is in the budget book? It might be easier. Yes, please. Let's go okay. one table at a time. All right. So I believe that the first department is city council. So, um, so as you can see, some of my goals and objectives there is um, to continue work with our new um, Civic Plus for new software. And I've reached, um, I've been having um, training with somebody at Civic Plus. I have a new trainer and he's very, very good. And we learned a lot from him in one session. Then we learned from somebody else um, for many more. And I've looked into having the city council meetings um, translated into Spanish um, on a real time simultaneous um, interpretation. And I've reached out to two companies and I believe, and I know there's some support with the city council, so I'd like to be able to do that. Um, let's see, any, there's no, well, the only significant staffing change is that um, Council McCarthy will hopefully be joining us back in the council chambers after um, moving from one room to the other. And um, recent accomplishments, um, I think, you know, just continuing getting better on the hybrid meetings with the the sound and the volume and the and the audio and the video, and we're still tweaking that. But now that we adopted the um, primary and secondary method, I think that would be a big help to all of us in terms of if we do have a technical issue. And um, and that's what I have. Um, and then in terms of budget for that. You know, all city councilors um, are 10% of the mayor's salary, so except for the council president, um, so they're still all at $15,000, and then um, the council president um, will receive fifteen five, 
and everything else, um, except for our new minute taker, there's been, a, um, last year there was an um, organ object added for that. And other than that, everything stayed the same. And most of our expenses, um, there was an increase in the um, advertising costs, which is very hard to predict because of um, it depends how many ordinances, traffic, zoning, ordinances, bonds that come through council to advertise. Advertising rates have gone you know, up in, in price. And, um, and the other increase is at the printing and binding, again, just basically due to costs of paper and, and um, you know, that, that's been an issue. And let's see, in our in-state travel, um, we requested an extra um, 1500 One of the councilors had asked for that, and that was um, also um, placed in, in, the, um, in the budget. Let's see, and dues and subscription, everything else seemed to stay the same. I can certainly talk more. <laughs> Council Marcello. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just noticed on the data, you have a bump up in ordinances, parking, and zoning. Mm -hmm. What do you know that we don't know? <laughs> it's just what you bring in. Um, for this, next year. <laughs> um, what's that? Oh, for next year? Uh, the estimates? Yeah. Just. Just looking just forward to the a guesstimate, work, really, in terms of um, I figured next year do, um, more zoning might come in than we didn't have for the first you know five or six months of this year, mm. so there might be more zoning, um, and you know, and just some just you know just trying to kind of yeah, guess what's to, going on. To, and those numbers are used to determine your advertising budget too. Um, it's kind of hard because it depends on the size of an ad. Um, so, but but that reflects why advertising costs have gone up and why I requested more money. It is reflective of that. So um, that is why. Do we have a um, target date for starting to use the civic, the um, software? Um, well, hopefully, um, you know, in the fall, you know, I was trying, you know, we got um, a little sidetracked with um, some special elections this year to be able to. Um, you know, work on it the first five months. It's your fault. Yep. And um, so I'm hoping um, over the summer, Maureen and I, um, we do have another um, training set, um, session set, and then there would obviously have to be some talk with the um, administrator, administration, um, um, due to the new turnover in administration. I know mm -hmm. the previous administration was on board with it, but I do have to have some conversations. Well, I mean, I think but, it's training more than anything yeah. else. Like, they have to be on board because we right. own it. And, right. Right. And a decision yeah. And they made, will have so. to be able to, um, they'll be trained to put in what yeah. they give me um, yeah. so, instead of. Um, and we need to be trained also. Um, not as much. Not as yes. much, but there has to <laughs> yeah. be some training. Yeah. There. So, you know, it, it takes time. And, um, you know, what we're trying to do, Maureen and I, is going to try to do like a dual, like do the regular agenda the way we do it, and then internally just do, um, if it's not a full agenda, but the same agenda, but through the software program. So to see how that comes out. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Councillor Dominguez. Oh, let the record show we've been joined by Councillor Watson Felt remotely. Councillor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Good to see you. Uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to see that the department is improving in so many areas. I know you, you have a new addition on your personnel, got a new members of the personnel on the electoral office, I think. We have a part-time person, but I was waiting for that for the election um, when we get to that budget, but yes. Okay, my, my question is based on, are you in full capacity with the employees that you need to have in the whole department, or you need you still have some? Well, we would never turn away more people, but um, but we are functioning of, of what we have. Okay, go back to uh, the translation, which I'm very grateful that I hear that you in the process of getting translation into Spanish for the council meeting. You say you had two company already set up. Can you uh, go over the, the price that you find out? And I, 
I talked to two companies. Um, one is an individual um, person that came, I visited, um, he came here and we talked um, back in April. And I know that at some point you wanted to speak um, or reach out to talk to them yourselves in terms of their Spanish and their fluency. And um, so his rate was about $70 an hour. And um, and the company, the other company that's based state interpreters, um, they are a bigger company and it's not, you know, you're not sure who you're gonna get for each meeting, but they're about $105 an hour. So there's a little bit of a difference. And, you know, I would like, if possible, you know, maybe have a trial, you know, do one trial meeting or something with, um, with one of them or one, you know, each of them. Very good. I, I, I like to make the same comment I made the other day when we were talking about translation that, you know, we need to make sure that the translation is universal so everybody mm -hmm. understands exactly right. what is meant mm -hmm. for the entire population, not only for one region or for one country. Right. So thank you so much yes. for your work. Thank You're you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, am, am I correct in am I correct in remembering that our school committee is already using live translation services? Yes. So and ha have I, you had an opportunity to? Yeah, I, I called Mindy over there, um, and I believe it's a, a teacher or a person from the school department that does it. So um, you know, I I I don't think she does it as a, a you know a second you know or job themselves but yes i had reached out to them to see how they did it and you know what it costs and i i don't know what they pay her or anything like that i think um i forget who else mindy suggested to reach out to but um yes i do know they do that so i'd like to be able to do that as well okay Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, I got the one person because um, I reached out to Revere, my, one of my, my colleagues there, and they use um, the individual mail that, um, that does basically owns his own business. So that's how you know I got some other names. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know anything about translation services. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not in that business, but yeah. um, just curious if yeah. you had had an opportunity to talk to them, mostly because I was yeah. curious if there were any sort of particular standards that we were looking for um, in terms of what an individual or company could provide. Yeah, um, I believe it all, I mean, I can reach out to IT, but I believe there's they go into a separate Zoom room that people can log into and that they would be um, basically translating at the same time as um, all of you in here are speaking. And so, I don't know in terms of like um, public testimony or anything like that of how it goes back and forth, but at least there's a different Zoom room that somebody would be able to listen to all in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chairman McLean. A follow up question on that is there's going to be any translation here in the room? Say we have a public hearing and we have many different languages here all combined. We're going to provide translation live right in here? I believe that they would most likely do it remotely from Zoom, but um, I can always ask about that. Yeah, that would be very important because uh, sometimes we had a large group of people and some of the topic might be pertaining to the Latino community and they don't even want it to come because they don't understand what's going on. So it's watching on Zoom only where most of the people are not maybe too familiar with Zoom if they wanted to be here presently. So I think what you're asking if somebody is just speaking in the room, so that would not be the case. It would be the case that somebody would have to be on Zoom listening to the meeting, not not like an, um, not here in the room talking or translating to a group of people. Is that? Um, I, I noticed that, for okay. example, in charge, we, we had translation service mm -hmm. where we provide some type of device. If we are here in the room, whoever is, uh, there's a group of Latino here, mm -hmm. they, if they need translation, they put the device, and the person who's translating might be in the other room translating what's going on here, so they know exactly what's going on. That's, that's something Something that I can look into. I, I'm not sure. I know we have assistive devices um, for people with um, you know hearing um, challenges, but in terms of um, having that for working in a different language, I. I I don't know. I have to be honest. I, I would have to look into that. 
Thank you for that, Council Dominguez. I, I agree. It's an important point of consideration. Mm -hmm. If we're going to say this is our primary meeting location, mm -hmm. we want to have our services appended to our primary meeting location. Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And agreed on um, translation services, so thanks, Councilor Dominguez. Um, I just would, would want to add that um, as an accomplishment, the uh, the iPads that you got to each councilor, which I think is something we've been talking about for a long time. I think it goes a long ways towards um, reducing paper and printing and all that kind of stuff. So appreciate that. You're um, and, and I'm also ready to make a motion on, on this one if we want to move on to the city clerk's office if there's no other comments. Move to approve the, person, the personnel um, budget in the amount of 178700 the expenditures amount in the amount of 74907 for a department total of 253607 Council Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the city council personnel budget in the amount of 178,700 expenditures in the amount of 74,907 for a total of 253,607 seconded by Councilor Stott. Well, we have one Councilor remote. So we will do a roll call vote. Let me get my order of call ready. Okay, doing a roll call vote. Councilor Merkel? Yes. Councilor Hapworth? Yes. Councilor Watson Felt? I see a thumbs up. <laughs> we'll work on the audio portion of this moving forward, I guess. I'm not sure why we're not here. Volume is on. Councilor Stott? Yes. And myself is a yes. That's five in favor, zero against. That matter carries. All right. So the next department we're going to is the city clerk's department. And as you um, trying to sum up for the mission statement that the city clerk is the um, custodian and keeper of records and, and the city seal and all the recording reporting of vital records that include the birth, death, and marriages that are processed and preserved and um, certified from our office. And there's they go back to the beginning. <laughs> I, th I think, eight, I don't know, 1800, 1600, um, we have birth records. Um, we do a lot of affidavits in the office as well, as long as dogs, um, business certificates, yard sales, um, you know, all other types of things as well. But um, the, the vitals keep us the most busy. And we can do those online in our DOD program now. We um, went to a new DOD program that is, seems to be a lot easier to use um, for, definitely for my staff, and I believe for the, um, the customers as well. You know, there have been a few complaints, but I don't think there's been as many as when we used um, view permit. So unfortunately, there's a little cost to that view permit. I know there was none, but that view permit goes down a lot and it's it's been very hard to search for dogs and it doesn't work always for for um, some of the licenses that we use so um, and we have some marriage and forms and other forms that we are translating into Spanish as well to put um, online and um, that that was um, and then I also signed up in time to get our state ethics commission on the online program Which is kind of a trial basis where instead of doing the paper for um, The acknowledgement of the um, summary of the conflict of interest law and the online training It can all be done by the um, employee online and I can send out um, reports on a monthly basis to department heads to see if their um, employees are in compliance with it Let's see, and some other, um, oh, sorry. And so that, those are a lot of like the mission and, and the goals and accomplishments on that. And um, as you can see, some of our um, birth records, our copies um, 
of our vital records have increased, and that's, you know, whether most of them are, believe it or not, in person. There are some online, but that's, you know, why we always have sort of a, you know, a busy counter in our in our room three, I call it, and um, and our marriages um, in, um, have gone up, and our vital our affidavits have also very time consuming, and unfortunately they have gone up too, and um, we're one is still a birthing hospital in Salem, so we're always going to have a lot of um, birth records sent to us, whether they they live in Salem or not, and so in there. Um, on going backwards on the expenditures or the expenses, um, there really has been no change from fiscal year 23. Um, you know, we asked basically for the same for 24, which have been um, added to the budget except for the dog licenses because of the new software program. But um, I believe it makes up for it in the end in terms of. Um, mostly like frustration um, and you know so it's more efficient and easier for it for the customers and I I think that's um, a benefit that outweighs the cost and on the um, personnel side I have some um, three um, union employees that I had to um, you know do the contractual um, salaries for them and so those are um, figured in there as well as um, um, and then on the um, non-management side, um, those were level funded, and then um, I believe it was a 2% COLA on that. And so I don't have, so those are the, the numbers. Council, Council Dominguez. Thank you, Councilor, Ma Councilor McLean. Chair McLean, sorry. Uh, thank you once again uh, to the clerk. And your department has been uh, very, very uh, active. Uh, I see it basically the last month for the specialization and many other, many others. But my, my comments, which is uh, an appreciation to you and to your fellow uh, employees, is that I see the effort that you have done on the bring the diversity into the whole, the whole spectrum, not only on on your personnel, but also on working on, on getting the translation on, as we just mentioned before, but also on, 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 the, on writing, and that's really benefit the entire city. And I think that you've been approaching so many other organizations because I, 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 I know firsthand your, your, your effort, but I recently you have a, a co collaboration with the school department to bring some of the bilingual bilingual students so they can be part of a program that will help uh, the election process. Not only will help in the election process, but also I think that we send the message to the youth to get involved in civic actions. So to me, that speaks very loud and clear that your effort as a, as a, as a department is, is, is very well received for the community. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And I think that's that level of diversity that you bring to, to your actions going to help in the long and the short run the, the, the move forward this year. So thank you so much. Yeah. Council Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean, to City Clerk. Uh, in your synopsis, uh, you had um, your initiative uh, for the department to participate in the Spanish language learning. Um, what, what's the level of participation? How do you feel that's going? Because so many people do come to your department who may not speak English. So far, I, I don't know if any of my employees took advantage of that. I Sometimes the dates and the times don't work for us, and it's very difficult to um, for everybody. Nobody can all go at once because we, there's got to be coverage in the office. Um, we're very fortunate that we have a bilingual um, employee in room three. Um, you know she's she's great, and um, you know she does get a little bit of the extra workload for. Um, for when the um, Spanish-speaking community does come in, and you know she's she's just 
you know, really, I can't say enough of um, being able to have her in my office. It's very beneficial for any department to have a bilingual person in their office. Um, we've been trying, she's been trying to teach um, some of the other girls in that same office a little bit of Spanish and, you know, just at least to converse with the customers if need be instead of going to the, the training for that. And, um, and when we get to the elections, I do have a bilingual person back in that office, which I'm thankful for. Seeing nothing further, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move to approve the personnel budget in the amount of three fifty two forty nine. The expenditures budget in the amount of thirteen thousand eight seventy for a grand total of three sixty four one nineteen. I'm not used to this end. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, oh, and one, one thing, I mean, I did send an email, and I want to thank um, Anna and Mayor Pangallo about, um, although it's not, um, you know, noted in, in the budget book, that that will be taken care of. So I appreciate that very much. And um, finally, I have my, oh, sorry. I know, it's different. You're on the opposite side of the room. It's a whole I different ballgame. Um not now, not today. Coun Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the city clerk personnel budget in the amount of 350,249, expenditures in the amount of 13,870 for a total of 364,119, seconded by Councilor Stott. Again, we are going to attempt a roll call vote. Um, my apologies to our, our Clerk for our committee tonight, Eileen Sacco. I'm going to do it in a different order than I did the first time and see if I can get it right. Um, Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. And Councilor Watson Felt. I can see you saying yes and I can see your thumb, but I can't hear you and I don't know why. It is. No, it's not muted. It's on. Um, and I am a yes, so that is five voting, five in favor, the matter carries. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, so we will hear you going forward, that's great. She's there. And we'll move forward to elections and registrations. Yes, so um, this um, election registrations is obviously a very important department. I mean, obviously council and vital records are too, but in the past, um, you know, especially since COVID, um, it's taken on a new meaning. And I'm pretty proud of like what we accomplish in elections and registrations, especially where in 2022, um, we had to um, become, you know, we were required by the um, the U.S. Justice Department to become a, um, a bilingual um, city in terms of our Spanish. And, you know, it's I'm glad to say that we already had a lot of things in Spanish, so we didn't have to go, um, you know, we were in very good shape there. And so last, or this election was our very first time having us, our own local elections with Spanish um, on the ballot. And, and I think it worked out very well. And I'm very happy with um, you know, what we accomplished there, like I said, in terms of um, you know, setting up our polling places, we're handicapped accessible, we have the virtual poll workers that can speak any language. It doesn't have to be somebody comes in and speaks Russian or Portuguese, we can help them as, with that as well. It's, it, they, there's like, I don't know how many languages on the, um, on that, on the um, iPad there. And um, so my goals and objectives, um, you know, probably Anthony is, been very patient with me. Um, I, we have an RFP that came back in for our um, voting equipment. I just really need to take a, a look at it in terms of um, um, picking a one of the two certified um, companies, you know, in the state that are allowed to provide us with um, equipment. And um, so that's one of my goals and objectives. And additionally, try to purchase something that would allow us to. Um, 
tabulate votes in the office without, especially for the next um, presidential, without having to send thousands of ballots to the polls for them to process themselves. And, um, and this is where I'm also very happy that um, we have an additional, um, well, our, we have a part-time bilingual person. Um, that, that spot has been, the part-time bilingual has been kind of a difficult one to attract and to retain. Um, but now, and, and that's one of the um, significant budget staffing changes, if it's approved, that I will be getting one um, full-time um, employee in that office, which will um, be bilingual and um, instead of the part-time person. And hopefully um, that person will, um, you know, will want to become full-time. And this is where Councilor Dominguez alluded to my, um, my work with some of the high school students to be um, bilingual and, and go to the polls and help to be, and they're not like missing school, they don't get marked absent. And I have four terrific kids and it's been great to see them and you know, all the poll workers love the the um, the youth and their enthusiasm and their, um, you know, to, to be there and work with them and, and they're, it's been working out very good and I hope I can gain more students um, all different ways. And, um, <laughs> Let's see, what else? Um, so that that's a lot of that, you know, in terms of um, my goals and objectives. Um, obviously, we had a very successful September and November 22 elections for the state elections. And, um, and I can say the 2023 special elections um, um, as well. And a lot of the um, permanent, um, a lot of the temporary vote by um, the Votes Act became permanent um, as of last year. So um, we've been working with that. There are some things in the council just the other we last week adopted something to at least help out um, our office a little bit without having to be open on a, on a Saturday for local elections. Um, but as you can see, some of the changes. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, that's all that I think that I want to cover. I, I apologize. I'm trying to look quickly down here. Um, the dual language and that. And yeah. so unless, um, and then also changing our charter or our home rule petition for the special election that, you know, I want to thank um, also um, the city solicitor, Beth Renard, who helped me work on that, and, and to thank you for the council for letting, um, to try to change the special act of um, 1960. That would only give me three weeks to have done a primary and a, and a final election for a special. So that, that was huge as well. And, um, and, um, and we got through our special election. So congratulations, Mayor Pangelo. And, um, and ready for, let's see. Um, yeah, 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 get to do it again. I had so much fun. <laughs> two down, two to go. Uh, let's see, our voters are um, actually, I just looked for the last time, they're 32,915, so that's gone up from a little bit of the estimated, estimate, estimated amount. And let's see, on, um, um, as you know, the, um, let's see, my request for seasonal labor, and I talked a little bit with that with the finance director last week or a week and a half ago about, you know, my request for the 94,000 for the seasonal labor, um, you know, it went down to what I had in fiscal year 2023. And I, I just put it in for that amount because there's three elections actually in fiscal year 2024. So not only having four elections this year, I'll be having, um, there'll be three elections for, um, you know, well, two elections at this time will be, plus the March one will be for this fiscal year, but calendar year, there'll still be three elections as well. Um, and that's why the increase in overtime, um, I requested that, um, you know, they, they um, level funded at fiscal year 2023, and I'm sure we'll have to um, figure that out if, um, you know, when we cross that bridge. And um, let's see, so that's, um, and as you can see that the um, part-time election worker was zeroed out and the one full-time asking worker was put in. And um, 
and the contractual step for my um, one ask me person in there, and um, and one of the you know the changes um, printing and binding the um, although um, it wasn't what I requested um, it was increased from fiscal year 23 because of um, you know there's just more elections and higher prices for printing and binding and um, voting machine services again all prices for coding and technology and everything that I have to do for my equipment, all the prices have gone up. Um, so I try to account for that as best as I could. And other than that, everything else seemed to be no change from fiscal year 23 to 24. It matched, I only requested those are level funded. Council Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean, to the city clerk. Uh, I think it's imperative so I'm glad that you have uh, money for a full-time bilingual person, uh, not just to be able to hire someone, um, but to retain them, because not having benefits uh, might keep people who would uh, want to have the job for a longer period. Um, so I think that's terrific, because I think it's really important for our city. Um, I do want to acknowledge a, a positive. Uh, some people have reached out and, and are grateful that s the polling uh, places have uh, a space for people who have mobility challenges. And want to mention that so people who in the past were not able to vote as easily as other people are able to do so. Yeah, there's there's been some, thank you, there's been some changes, you know, that we use on the local and the state level in terms of even if they didn't want to go to, I mean, the polls, there, they certainly can, but there's also um, what we call the um, Omni Ballot now as well, that um, people that have vis visual or um, um, mobility with their hands to mark a ballot have, have the ability now to get a ballot also online, so. There's some, some good changes and some not, but but I'm glad that every voter that wants to vote can vote and vote on their own independently if they want to. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean. Uh, I have one curiosity question that maybe I should know, but how, how do you prepare for a special election so quickly and in terms of the budget, what is the number exactly, what is the cost of that special election? If you can reveal that to, to us, how much it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we figured out what it sort of would cost. Like we figured out that each election, like poll workers are about $25,000 and we went through all that and there was a, um, an appropriation that came in to the council, I believe you said January, that gave me the, um, the, the, the supplement to be able to run that election. So um, that is where I got that money. But in terms of um, putting it together, just years of experience and having a good staff. Well, so. Just <laughs> noticing that we had 17 years with, without having a, a, lot, a lot, election like yeah. that, and that, that was that was really a a, a a very impressed way of doing it. So thank you <laughs> once again. I'm very impressed. Thank you. You're welcome, Councilor Merkel. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean. I just want to very quickly um, thank you and your staff. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in elections, uh, good changes, mail-in voting, uh, a lot more options, um, and uh, I appreciate that that means a lot of change, a lot more work to do. Um, I, I think it's great we've crossed the threshold uh, for Spanish ballots, and I, I, I like the program where students come in, and, and I love anything that involves a collaborative effort with students for civic engagement. and. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of a lot happening over the last couple of years in elections and in special elections. So I just want to say thank you to you and your staff. You're welcome. As as difficult it is and as it's stressful, but I do love elections. So there's that. <laughs> I kind of not like giving much more, but. Um, Madam City Clerk, did I hear you mention as you were giving the description that there are. Um, polling staff making use of iPads for translation services. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, um, they're called virtual poll workers, and they're basically um, they are an iPad that when you log into the software program, um, it comes up, and um, if somebody comes on and you tell them that I need somebody that speaks Spanish, and um, it, whatever it does, 
and it brings a Spanish person on. They don't have to know the election laws um, per se because they're they're from all over the country. But they're you, as long as like the the warden would say to them, you know, can you please tell them I need um, whether it's ID or um, they need to fill out this form. Well, the forms are all in Spanish, but um, you know, just something that if there's difficult, then that translator will translate it to the person. Um, in the in the in their language, and that person would speak back to the person on the iPad, and um, it's a real person, and that um, that person then would translate back to English um, to my ward and a clerk. Is that, and, a, is that available at all of our polling locations? Yes, I have. Well, I have fourteen of them. Um, not fourteen. I'm sorry. Um, I have eight of them. So it's like um, they they share in the double, and then one one and one two each have one. So. And then I can also use it, I haven't had to yet, but I can also use it like in my vital records room or anybody can use it. Does It's not, it's just called virtual poll workers at how the company probably marketed for, for the city clerks and town clerks, but I think it can be used for anything. Yeah, okay. kind of cool. That's a great service. Um, I'm, I'd be curious to, to to hear the follow-up on maybe we can be using it in other locations because elections tend to be a short part of the calendar. So if it's something that we can use mm -hmm. to support our services the rest of the calendar year round that we're already paying for the service yeah. anyway, yeah. might not they, be a bad idea. You just get billed for the minutes that you use it. So uh, yeah. It's still probably worth it. Yeah, it's still, I believe it is. Again, one of those um, benefits that outweigh the cost. And I don't think, I can't remember, but it might be 50 cents a minute. I, I, I can't recall offhand, but it's not bad at all. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Seeing nothing further. Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move to approve the personnel budget in the amount of 248176 the expenditures budget in the amount of 56650 for a grand total of 304826 Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the elections and registration personnel budget in the amount of 248,176 expenditures in the amount of 56,650 for a total of 304,826 seconded by Councilor Stott and I will do a roll call vote once again starting with Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. And Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. That worked great that time. I am also a yes, so that is five in favor. That matter carries. Thank you, Madam City Clerk, for joining us. You're welcome. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We live in these chambers this week. We'll move forward to purchasing. Welcome back. Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, so my name is Anthony Delaney. I am the Chief Procurement Officer for the City of Salem. Uh, the purchasing department is composed of myself and one full-time and one part-time assistant. Uh, we uh, oversee the uh, purchasing and disposal of assets for the entire city, including the schools. Uh, small purchases are initiated by staff members and all of the, the, the all of the departments they get approved by their department head and then they come to our office for our approval where we make sure that they're being paid from the right budget that they've been procured with the correct uh, vehicle or contract uh, and then they get converted to purchase orders uh, larger requisitions or procurements go through a more formal process where our office will assist in developing the specs uh, publishing the required notices, receiving the bids, evaluating them, and award, formatting and awarding the contract. Uh, we also handle uh, any disposal of surplus uh, property or materials uh, as needed. Okay, thank you. Probably one of these one of these functions that maybe some folks in the private sector don't totally understand, but really, really critical for a municipal operation because there's a lot more rules governing how we 
make our agreements and our contracts and what we're going to purchase. So appreciate the diligent work. Yeah, and they vary based on the kind of good or service you're ordering and how much it costs and a uh, multitude of factors. Councilor Cohen. Thank you, Chair McLean, to you. Um, I'm not sure the r rationale, but for some reason, energy projects don't require RFPs. And yet, I'm encouraging us to do that when the project is of a certain size or larger, and hope that will be something that we will uh, insist on so that we don't, so we have the proper process. That makes sense. Mm uh so that is true there there's a long and sometimes very strange list of uh procurements that don't require certain rfps or ifps they may be subject to other other regulations but uh yes energy projects i, I assume you're talking about uh energy efficiency improvement projects not utility purchases yeah uh, those are governed uh under chapter 25a um we do have the option of, of conducting uh, a standard procurement on those. No, don't necessarily need to avail ourselves of the 25A exemption. That's a decision that we made with both my, not necessarily just by me, but in collaboration with the departments and probably on a per project basis. But we've also, we also conducted a, a full RFP last year for a, an ESCO company to assist us in developing, procuring uh, all of those projects going forward. Okay, seeing nothing further, Councilor Appworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you want to do uh, fixed costs separately? I do. Okay. So the uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the general admin personnel budget in the amount of one eighty three seven forty one, the general administration expenditures budget in the amount of twenty five thousand three ninety six for a grand total of two hundred nine one hundred thirty seven. Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the purchasing general administration personnel budget in the amount of 183,741, expenditures in the amount of 25,396 for a total of 209,137, seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth? Yes. Councilor Merkel? Yes. Councilor Stott? Yes. Councilor Watson Felt? Yes. And I am also a yes. It's five in favor, zero against. That carries. Uh, we will move into fixed costs. I, I do want to offer the reminder that if there's anything related to capital improvements, you're welcome to dive right into that. Okay. Uh, there, there isn't anything uh, for my department related to capital improvements, although my department works and touches so many of those things. I myself don't oversee a, any kind of budget like that. Uh, our fixed costs mostly consist of uh, advertising notices for, for bids, uh, the software that we use to get to maintain our electronic signature records, and uh, cost to oh, uh, and cost to uh, maintain our certifications. Last year, uh, we moved the wireless cell phone uh, line out of the purchasing department and into IT, so that's uh, not there anymore. So really, it's just. Uh, the copiers and related supplies. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll move right to a motion. Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move to approve the fixed cost expenditures budget in the amount of 39,181. Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the purchasing fixed cost expenditures in the amount of 39181 seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth? Yes. Councilor Merkel? Yes. Councilor Stott? Yes. And Councilor watson Felt. Yes. I am also a yes. That's 5-4. The matter carries. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Collector. Hi, my name is Bonnie Sally, and I'm the collector. Um, I run the office downstairs. We have four employees. One is Spanish speaking, Araceles, and she is a wonderful employee who helps out very many people that come into the office. 
We actually collect all the revenue that comes in through the city, property taxes, personal property, motor vehicle excise, water, sewer, and trash, parking tickets, boat tax, mooring slips, and city ordinance tickets. We are also passport acceptance agents, which we get recertified every year, and all of us are certified. And again, we, you know, rely on ARI a lot, especially lately for passports, because that it does get difficult. And I have looked into getting them in Spanish, but believe it or not, the government does not provide them in Spanish. So all you can do is assist your customers at this time. They they aren't giving us any any passports that are in Spanish, which I'm kind of surprised at that, but. So far, that's that. Um, processing municipal lien certificates, which are um, realtors, anybody that's had an insurance claim in their house, they have to have a legal document that comes from our office that says all the taxes are paid before an insurance company will pay out or before they can transfer ownership of a property so that a new owner doesn't get caught having taxes owed on something that was the prior owner. So that's pretty much what we do in the collector's office. And I don't know if anybody has any questions. Nothing really has changed at all in our um, budget. It's level funded. So we haven't asked for anything this year. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean. And thank you, Bonnie, for all you do. I'm very familiar with the departments. I usually pay a lot of tickets over there. and I want it <laughs> So you're doing a great job. Yeah. So thank you for for what you're doing. I just wanted to go back to the uh, passport program that you just mentioned. Are you advertising that type it's of program? It's funny, because I just met this morning um, with Mayor Pangallo, and that is something that we are going to now put in when they send out their welcoming packets to the new residents. We're going to make out a little postcard, and we are going to put it in there. The other thing that I'm looking to do is put it in with the tax bills, but I'm not quite sure that I want to do the tax bills or if I'm better off doing the water sewer bills because a lot of people that are owners don't necessarily live in the property, whereas I might get to more people if I do the water and sewer. So that is something that we're going to look forward to doing too. But I'm, water and sewer only goes out quarterly. But I don't think that enough people know that we do do passports in City Hall. And it's getting harder and harder now to do it at the post office because I honestly don't think the post office really wants to be in that business. So I do want to get that out to more people that we have, that we do that and we do accept appointments every day of the week. So. That was my point. And be ready because you're going to have a lot of people coming to you. So Good. No, that's a good thing. Um, but like I say, we got to get the word out. And I'm not quite, I think that's going to be great putting in the, the packets, and I do think I'm probably going to lean towards the water sewer bills rather than the real estate bills, because I think I'll get more people that actually live in the city that way. Good. Thank you. Welcome. Councilor Marcello. Thank you, Chair. Um, how do you make an appointment? Can you do it online, or do you have to call so it? So far, we don't do it online. That would be a little difficult, because we, you know, keeping up with the spots that are already filled, so we have people calling in. Okay. And we're taking them that way because um, we have to make sure that we don't have two at the same time because when people are paying, it takes a little while to do a, a full passport because um, once we start it, we have to finish it. But that's per the government rules. You can't like leave something half done and wait for someone to come back with a picture or something because it's just too much personal information on and everything. So as soon as it's done, um, it has to go in the safe and be brought right over to be mailed by the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, two questions in my mind. Uh, the first is about the municipal liens. I just noticed that there was a pretty drastic drop in the trend year over year over year, and I have some assumptions about what that might be, but I'd like to ask if you have a sense of what's actually driving that change in numbers. I think that we had a lot more housing sales um, right after COVID when we did that great big housing and the rates were better. Now the rates are going up. So as many people aren't refinancing as they were before. So they're not requesting as many municipal lien certificates. I do know that banks still require the municipal lien certificate. So certainly if they are in the looking to do that, they would have to send it in. So I would have to only believe that there's not as many passing papers anymore and you know, as it was when the when it, that really crazy housing bust, you know, 
boom that we had a little while ago. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then the question that I think probably every one of my residents would ask is, how can I get a discount? You can't. How <laughs> no. no, that was a good answer. <laughs> you can get a water discount if you pay your water bill by the discount date. So we do have discounts for that. There is no such thing as a discount on a real estate bill, unfortunately, and not on an excise bill either. All right. Well, we'll take one out of three, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Want me to ask. Um, and the uh, the assessor, uh, uh, when he presents, he can talk about the abatement options that exist for folks. He has a lengthy list of those, I believe. Oh, great. We love discounts in this chamber. <laughs> Councilor Domingos? I just, rem I just remember a, a, a program that, I don't know if it was your department that dry when people bring one canes. Yes. That's from your department. Can you go over what it'll be about so people? Yeah. So parking tickets, once a year, it does go through the council. And it's usually right after Thanksgiving, and we do it for 30 days up until Christmas Eve. And people bring in canned goods that we then do donate to the food pantry. And we'll take off up to two fees off the tickets. The only thing that we can't take on is the mock fee from the registry because they actually bill the city for that, um, it actually gets off, taken off our cherry sheet money, so we'd lose money if we did that. But we do have two fees that will take off the late charge and then the first penalty after that. So they can save up to $30 on late tickets. Um, and it's called Peas for Fees because they donate canned goods. So that's kind of the name we came up with years ago. Um, it just, everybody really loves the program. We'll, we'll usually run a list and send out information to anybody that has multiple tickets to just let them know that we're doing it at that time of year. But that will be something that will be put forward to you probably around the middle of November to approve. Okay, seeing nothing further. Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have to move to approve the personnel budget in the amount of 27674. Expenditures budget in the amount of 8,300 for a grand total of 278,974. Council Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the collector personnel budget in the amount of 270,674. Expenditures in the amount of 8,300 for a total of 278,974. Seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth? Yes. Councilor Merkel? Yes. Councilor Stott? Yes. And Councilor Watson Felt? Yes. I am also a yes. Five, four, zero against. That carries. Thank you very much. Have a nice night. Thank you. You as well. On to the assessor. Welcome back. Lots of time under your belt this time. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Good evening, counselors. Um, Stephen Cortez, Director of Assessing. Uh, the FY24 budget proposal for the Assessing Department has not changed much from last year, with a few exceptions that I will explain. But before I do that, I want to share a brief synopsis of the duties and responsibilities of the Assessing Department before I begin. The assessing department operates on a cyclical basis, most no notably with our revaluations and inspections. However, our duties essentially remain the same from year to year. The assessors are required by Mass General Law to value all real and personal property and prepare tax billing commitments for real and personal property and motor vehicle and boat excise tax. The assessing department staff consists of two principal clerks, two assistant assessors, one director of assessing, along with three board members. Our daily routine includes assisting the customers with inquiries, abatements and exemptions, inspection scheduling, address changes, deed updating, identifying parcel changes, and updating the city tax maps, just to name a few. We put extensive work into our portion of the website, which goes into great detail regarding the assessment process, the inspection process, and timelines for filing for abatements and exemptions. I would recommend that anyone listening, please view, uh, please feel free to visit our portion of the site, especially the personal exemptions that are offered for individuals who could possibly benefit with help in paying their tax bills. Uh, 
So with uh, salaries and uh, there's been no staff change this fiscal year, we are fully staffed. Uh, personnel lines reflect cost of living adjustments and any salary survey adjustments. Um, contract services line. Here I cleaned up and consolidated the descriptions. Our contract services line is where we pay for the majority of our functional operating expenses, such as maintenance fees for our Patriot Properties Assess Pro Camera System, legal counsel regarding ATB cases and TIF agreements, tax billing and sales analysis work plan, three appraisal reports mandated by the DOR for Salem's personal property utility companies, and required posting of our notices, some of which these costs have changed due to the changing market and inflation. The real change here comes from the addition of the pushpin and map programs that were formerly approved in our FY23 CIP budget. They are now moved to our continuing contract service budget line. NearMap is an aerial imagery capture program that consists of three or more plane flyovers per year. It's like a Google Earth, but more often and with clearer images. NearMap is also used by the IIT department, the engineering department, the planning department, fire department, and the parking department for their respective needs. Although we share this program with multiple departments and users, splitting the cost is more a logistical burden for finance than it is to keep it in one department's budget. Pushpin is a program that utilizes the images captured by NearMap and runs through an AI technology to detect changes in the parcels. These changes could range from new additions to demolitions and reconfigurations. Sometimes work is done without building permits and there are times when the assessing department is flat out denied access to the property. In these cases, it is state law that we estimate the percentage of completion of the work done. This program helps us fine tune our estimates when we are denied entry due to lack of permits, fear of government, or during this post COVID era. So far with these two programs that cost roughly 9,700, we have collected 27,000 in today, uh, uh, as of today's date in new growth tax dollars. It is already paid for itself and then some. To refresh your memory, new growth tax dollars are used to help raise the levy limit, which is used to pay for the city's budget and other articles approved by the city council. For FY23, 50% of the budget was funded by the tax levy. The remainder came from state aid, local receipts, enterprise, and CIP funds, and other revenues. Printing and binding and uh, office supplies stayed the same. Um, they're pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, out of uh, then in-state travel meetings. Out of this budget line comes our dues for courses, workshops, and seminars that are vital to the assessors, clerks, and board members in the, in the department to stay abreast of the latest legal changes in mass general law and procedures and requirements. Every year, the professional meetings and dues for the MAAO and the Essex County Assessors Association goes up a year ago, we filled the vacant position of assistant assessor with the hiring of Jim Hall. In order to hold this position, he must may obtain his MAAO designation by attending courses and workshops. The clerks and the assessors with designations must also attend these meetings to keep our designation standing as members. Um, and then the last is the CIP request. Uh, the assessing department requests uh, EV hybrid vehicle uh, to be shared and utilized by the assessors who perform daily field work. Currently, our monthly stipends um, pay for gas, which do not factor in mileage and wear and tear to the personal vehicles. Also, parking can be difficult with tourists and garage renovations and capacity limits that hinder the productivity of the staff. We have calls from concerned residents and the police department to confirm our assessors are actually in the neighborhood. Even so, the assessors have accumulated parking tickets from meters when inspections have taken longer than expected. At uh, one point in time long ago, the assessing department did have a vehicle. I understand there are other departments that have city vehicles, um, which probably are not used every day as the assessors use their own personal vehicles. This request will not only save time and elevate productivity, but it will also provide a sense of security and trust within the community as we strive to meet our tasks and goals that keep the city running. Um, in conclusion, overall, outside of the CIP request, the assessing the budget, 
budget has increased slightly due to change in market and inflation and from the addition of the former CIP programs into our contract services line. The assessing department is tasked with many duties, all of which factor down to calculating the tax amount the city can levy to support the budget that's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I I did notice that the the fringe benefit, the mileage reimbursement, had decreased quite a bit, and so it seems like the request for an additional vehicle is the reason for that, right? We're, we're looking to move people out of using their personal vehicles into potentially using a vehicle that's going to be purchased by the department. Um, up, up. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate, and I think there's some repurposing of some vehicles that the city owns. Um, that is being looked at for this. Yes, but are are you benefiting from one of those vehicles or are you requesting money to purchase a vehicle? I'm benefiting from one of those vehicles. Um, Chair, if I could just provide some clarification. It's reflected in the capital plan um, in that the capital plan should reflect all sort of as asset management um, investments. And so because the, the vehicle was repurposed, uh, the assessing department, uh, based on that plan, will have access to that vehicle uh, to um, work toward meeting the needs that the assessor has laid out uh, tonight. So what is, the, what is the capital request paying for? The... The cap, it's in the capital plan, but there isn't a specific uh, capital vote associated with it. It's the plan is reflecting the, the asset being reallocated within the plan. Okay. Um, how many assessors are, are doing field work, are actually out conducting this work? Two, every day. Okay. And so we're talking about one vehicle that's being repurposed to the department? They'll be sharing it. Uh, okay. Mr. Chair, if I could add some further clarification. My understanding is that I believe the plan is for there to be a, um, a pool, for lack of a better term, of some vehicles that are available um, for certain departments to use that go out into the field on a regular basis. And so we're working to determine how to operationalize that um, uh, under the new administration's leadership to, to finalize that. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe maybe this is really where I should be directing the question. I mean, do, do you have a sense, Mayor Pangalo, of how many actual field agents are supposed to be drawing on this pool of vehicles that we're distributing to the city and how that offsets the number of personal vehicles that are being used? I mean, you've been with us for the past several days, so you've heard me ask the question, like, why aren't we giving out parking passes to the people doing this work? Like, why is it necessary for them to be accruing parking tickets? It seems like an eminently solvable problem. So uh, this is one of the instances where I'm going to, I would defer to the uh, former acting mayor. Uh, this was a plan developed by that administration for repurposing the get around vehicles. So I, I don't have information for you immediately at hand about the number of uh, employees in which department would be benefiting from these, these vehicles, but we can get that for you. Okay. I just don't want us to end up in a situation where we, I mean, repurposing the vehicles makes sense to me if they're not being utilized, but... I don't want to end up in a situation where we repurpose the vehicles, take on the cost of maintenance and gas and mileage and repair, and still have city staff getting parking tickets because there's still not enough vehicles for them, right? So um, that, that would be helpful information, I think, to have to bring some context to this conversation. Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't know if I, I think I just might not understand what the, what the $57,000 is for. Can, can you explain that again? Uh, the $57,000 was the initial estimate presented by the department when requesting a vehicle. In light of the fact that there are vehicles available under the previous acting mayor's plan that can be repurposed, the, the cost is reflecting what it would have cost to obtain the vehicle, but the capital plan is... The effort of the capital plan is to provide a fully robust sort of 30,000 foot perspective on uh, what assets are allocated where. And so the cost was left in there to demonstrate that there was a request for a certain amount of money for a vehicle and the vehicle is being provided, um, but there isn't an associated vote associated with that $57,000. I hope that makes sense. I, I can rethink how that gets presented in future years when assets have been reallocated amongst departments, but we, it was maintaining that there was a request that was made by the department for a certain type of vehicle. Um, and that vehicle has been accommodated, but not through a specific purchase, but through a, a savings elsewhere. Got it. Okay. I think that makes sense. Um, and then I, I think I just need to also understand the, um, 
the requests for the vehicle. So I guess in my mind, I'm, I mean, employees are driving to work, parking their car somewhere, and then getting into a city car, and then driving that and parking that somewhere else. In my mind, I mean, you, you should probably be parking legally anyway, so where, where are the parking tickets coming from? And would, would the city not ticket a, a city vehicle? Is that how that works? Is that a policy? To Councilor McLean's point, it seems like a solvable problem that wouldn't require us to purchase a vehicle um, that's gonna sit somewhere for half the day and then be used other parts of the day. So I'm just, I'm just trying to understand the logic behind that. Uh, my understanding, and I think the, um, the traffic and parking team in the police department may be, may be best to help inform this conversation, but um, I, this has been something that's been looked at multiple years, but I do believe because of the, the, the parking, the permit parking requirements in certain neighborhoods, I think we were challenged to determine what type of pass would be applicable in all instances, and also to just ensure that there are never misuse of passes, not to assume that something like that would ever happen. Um, and my understanding is that if it's an official, officially marked vehicle, that that is something that the if someone's going around and reviewing the parked vehicles in that neighborhood would recognize that someone's here on official city business. Additionally, uh, uh, to um, Assessor Cortez's point about um, these are folks coming up to someone's door asking to enter their home and there's no official looking vehicle in the neighborhood. And so having an official vehicle parked just outside when someone's coming up to be asked to let into your home, we think is also an important consideration for members of the community to see this is indeed someone who is from the city and not and not something else happening. Um, and so I do think that there are complexities related to the parking passes, um, uh, but also it's that additional layer of ensuring comfort to be let into someone's home. I get, yeah, I, I think I just need to think on that for a little bit longer because I, I, in my mind, it seems like we're um, this is a perception a perception issue that we're spending fifty seven thousand dollars on and, and adding, I guess, in some way, adding a vehicle to the city fleet. Um, I'm just having a hard time swallowing that logic as as a reason for why we need to, to purchase a new vehicle. Um, and I, I think I. I this is on me having caused confusion. Uh, it's no additional new purchase. It's one of the get around vehicles that was already purchased. It was just reflecting that the department's ask what the value of that ask was. And it's reflecting that that ask was satisfied through the repurposing of the get around vehicle. And so it's a, there's no new money that's being spent for it. And that vehicle has been added to a pool so that I think we're working on figuring out how the departments, so if the assessors need to go out from nine to 12, and then if another department, uh, maybe inspectional services needed the vehicle from 12 to two, they could take it out. And what we have to, I believe, and figure out operationally is how we're gonna set that up so that, um, I don't wanna necessarily use this word, but almost like a zip car model for staff so they can take it out, um, is what I understand the acting mayor's, uh, previous um, former acting mayor's vision was for those, uh, repurposing those vehicles. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I'm jumping in again. Um, to, to, to your comment about how this could be better clarified. So as I'm looking through the CIP, the way I'm mentally clarifying this is I'm looking at the funding source, right, and understanding that some of these funding sources we're going to be taking direct votes on, like the bond order, and that is real money that we're going to be drawing on versus the other that is kind of listed for this vehicle, which is not something that we're going to vote on and appropriate new funds for. Um, is that is that a fair? That's perfect, yes. So so, um, so that's kind of how I've been looking at that, but I do I do think it's fair to digest the fact that even in the transference of assets, you're transferring responsibility for these assets, right? And so there will be some real costs associated with maintenance of these fleets for the folks who are using them and for the city as a whole. I, I want to pick up on the question of assessors who are approaching people's doors. What what are we giving them to identify themselves when they are going out into a neighborhood and knocking on somebody's door? I mean, somebody's not going to drive a vehicle from door to door to door, they're gonna park and they're gonna canvas a neighborhood. So when one of your staff does approach a home and says, I need to conduct this city business, do they have particular clothing? Do they have an ID? Like what do they have that lets them represent themselves appropriately? Yes, we do have IDs that are issued by the police department. And uh, we go out and we make sure that we show our IDs when we're knocking on the doors. A lot of the time, um, you know, when we're in neighborhoods and we're parking the, our cars and just walking to, you know, house to house to house, um, neighbors are looking outside their windows and they're seeing where we're coming from. Um, we've had people come out and, and record 
going into our their personal vehicles just and then you know calling to making sure and before they leave you know stay here let me call and make sure you who you say you are um so yeah that uh, it will definitely help with that but yes we do have ids that we do show um that are issued by the police department with our pictures okay excellent and believe me i relate it is door knocking season coming up yet again so i get it okay counselor stott Thank you. Um, I had uh, one quick question and one comment. So um, I think we've discussed this before. My day job is a national company that does property inspections as well. Fully support the use of a marked car because I'm assuming a lot of your inspections are also drive by yeah. where the inspector doesn't get out of the car and just drives by and takes a photo. Um, we've had a lot of issues with that in other parts of the country, but I would definitely support that for safety as well. Um, my question is about the board, actually. Could you explain to me what the role is on the assessor board and what their responsibilities are? I'm mostly asking just because they have the highest line item salary-wise of any of our board members. Yeah. So we have a three-member board, um, and they, by law, they're the ones who sign off on the commitments that are issued from the assessing department to the collector's department to have them actually um, collect uh, give them the um, uh, go-ahead to collect uh, the funds. They also are the party that's uh, responsible for um, going over our abatements. So we uh, process the abatements, and we present it to them, and we show them everything with the facts and uh, our inspections and all the, our data changes. If there's any, um, they have questions for us. They ask us. It almost keeps us in line as a check and balance in a way in that aspect when it comes down to abatements. Um, and we have a uh, former assessor who is also on the board too. Um, so it helps with um, uh, the functionality of uh keeping the procedures and requirements in line uh, with what the assessing department is uh, built for. Councilor Merkel. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean. Uh, yes, I, I had a couple of questions too about um, the, the vehicles um, being uh, repurposed for, uh, for your, for your um, workers. You said that they go out, um, two of them go out every day. Is uh, Okay, so I really agree with, with your concerns about um, the vehicle having an identity, you know, being identified as a city vehicle along with the ID. Um, I, I think it would be problematic. I, I really appreciated Councillor Stott's um, comment about sometimes you're not even going there in, in, in this day and age. Uh, and also, it's, it's their identity of their personal vehicle. Uh, also, generally, if they're going out that much in their own vehicles, I mean, uh, often people get reimbursed then for gas and the wear and tear on their vehicle. So am I assuming that they're not? We have a stipend that's for the gas that doesn't account for the wear, the wear and the tear, pop tires, anything like that. Okay, so that's a consideration in my mind uh, as well that they're they're using their own vehicle for work, uh, and I think workers or parking tickets. Not to interrupt you. But yeah, yeah. Well. So I, I think workers, you know, um, shouldn't be responsible uh, for that. Even my old days as, as a as a nanny using my vehicle, everything was, you know, was reimbursed. And it sounds like it's only gas. So that's also wear and tear on somebody's vehicle if they're using it that much. Um, so I just want to express that I, I understand and support all that reasoning that you've presented. Councilor Marcello. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the software that, that you purchased. I'm really happy to see that it's been successful. Um, do you know if it's been successful in other departments as well? Yes. Yes, other departments call me up and they say, you know, we have another user, you know, in our our staff that wants to use this. Is it possible? And and it is, you know, we have a limited amount of users that we can um, set up. And so we're constantly be, being called to ask, you know, can we, you know, have someone else join uh, to use this program? Because it's been beneficial to these departments um, for their needs. Uh, so fire, when they're looking at, 
you know, how to get into the building. They can see different areas. And this is flyovers that happen three times per year. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the latest and greatest. It's not like Google Earth where you, you it was like two years ago or whatever. Right. Um, and then you have the planning department when they want to know or engineering how to, you know, what's the route, the best route for like a rotary or, you know, school buses, you know, when they need to take that into effect. Um, so, so, so let me ask you this. When you get, a, when you get the um, images back, yeah. um, what's the process then that you have to do yourself? Or any user, what what do you have to do? There's nothing that we have to do, so it's updated all on on the site itself. So they have a, a username and a password. And so, so are you telling me that the software does the comparisons from the previous flight? Oh, okay, so the, there's there's that's there's near map and there's pushpin. Pushpin identifies the differences in the images taken by near map. The I, uh, the other departments have access to near map, so the images of the flyover. They don't have access to the push pin, which is the um, AI generated uh, differential between flyover to flyover. So they're using um, the images only. They're not using the portion that has the detection. Oh, but so they. Can, I thought so. I thought that the conservation agent was going to be able to use that to see the differences. So they can see the differences um, because what you could do is you can uh, change. Um, there's like a little tab that said, you know, you go from flyover to flyover, and it and so you see how the image changes, mm -hmm. but they don't have the push pin one. The push pin one is the one that's specifically for the assessing department that just shows this person built a new in-ground pool with a addition and a deck onto it, you know, and it cold, color codes that out for that specific purpose and reason. So they can still see it if they're looking at a, yeah. a particular property. They mm -hmm. just press click on a button and they can see the image change from one okay. to another, but they don't get the one that's like, this one changed, that one changed, this one changed. So Pushpin will provide some sort of a report that will give you yes. a list of properties that yes. have changed. And d and it does it also know what the changes are? Yes. Or does it just, wow, okay. Wow, nice. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councilor Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean, uh, to you. This, uh, you are um, probably the most under... Uh, misunderstood and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, underrated uh, department. Um, I want to talk about the major changes that trigger new assessments. Um, you talked about, um, you know, renovations, additions, pools, whatever. I know that in 2014, when we went from, you know, 13 to 70 solar arrays, that triggered a lot of you know, assessments under the previous assessor. Um, and you talked about uh, lack of permits. So do you, if you realize that there's a lack of permit on something that required one, are you notifying inspectional services? Um, so we research to see if there is permits taken out before we, you know, just assume that there isn't. Um, and then we call over and we say, hey, you know, this one has an addition on it. Possibly, was it a clerical error? Did you guys put it on a wrong house that it shouldn't have been put on or whatever? So we just asked that question anyways, just to make sure that it wasn't put on the wrong house. So they're aware based on that. Great. So um, another thing on the energy efficiency side. So there's going to be, hopefully, a lot more full house conversions of air source heat pumps, which would, you know, a significant increase in the value to the property um, is inspectional services because that 100% of the time requires a permit, you know, usually an electric and maybe a building, sometimes both. Um, would they be notifying you because you may not see that with your software? So we, we, um, we have access to the permitting system and we run reports for that. 
uh, we send out letters for building permits before we do any kind of knock on doors. So we allow them, you know, the time to call us back and schedule an inspection for any kind of permits that were taken out. Um, so for that, we do. Um, for the most part, it's when it comes down to that, it, it really comes down to sales. So the sales really will dictate what houses with those new features are selling for. And from there, we follow the market. So we raise or lower based on that. So that's really how uh, the assessments are determined when it comes down to upgrades like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing nothing further, Councilor Hepworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move to approve the personnel budget in the amount of 366047 and the expenditures budget in the amount of 70885 for grand total of 436932 Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the assessor's personnel budget in the amount of $366,047, expenditures in the amount of 70885 for a total of 436932 Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councillor Merkel? Yes. Councillor Stott? Yes. And Councillor Watson Felt? Yes. I am also a yes. That's 5 4 0 against. The matter carries. I just want to say thank you so much for your questions and your, um, your comments. I appreciate it. Thank you for the information and for being here. Moving on to our treasurer. I think this is one of my favorite sessions so far. One of our mm -hmm. core administrative services for our city on deck tonight. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Kristen Lindbergh and I am the treasurer for the city of Salem. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. So the primary function of the treasurer's office is to preserve, protect, and manage the financial resource, resources of the city uh, by means of receiving and dis dispersing funds. So basically the treasurer's office takes in every single dollar that the city makes and um, they expend every single dollar that the city has to spend, whether it's to vendors, payroll, and whatnot. Um, we're also responsible for safeguarding these funds and maximizing the um, interest on these funds, whether it's from moving, you know, checking interest rates, moving from bank to bank, or moving um, the funds within the same bank, from, but from one type of account to another, like from an MMA account that's getting 4% to a six month CD that's getting 6.5%. Um, it's hard to move banks. Usually when you, a bank knows that you're gonna move, they'll, they'll offer to match you know, the interest rate of, of what you're gonna get. So um, it's usually moving the funds um, within the same bank, but from different types of accounts. Um, we also oversee the tax title and foreclosure process, which um, from start to finish is everything from identifying properties that are behind in their taxes and working closely with the tax title attorneys to put liens on the properties and um, efforts for collection, sending out letters, uh, phone calls, whatnot, um, hopefully collecting all the money that's in arrears on these properties um, instead of moving forward with land court and foreclosure, which we tried to avoid, but it, it does happen. Um, I'm fairly new here. I've only been here for a few months, so I, I'm not sure when the last au you know public auction was, um, but that is something that I'm going to be looking into on FY24. Um, Again, it's, it's kind of a bittersweet process. You don't want to foreclose. Um, but then again, we, we got to get these, um, these properties back on the tax roll. So we also work, the treasurer's office also works closely with finance um, for 
uh, to negotiate short and long, long-term borrowing. Uh, we also work closely with HR to get payroll out the door every week. Um, that's about that's about it. Are there any questions on on that piece? <laughs> no. Okay, so. For the goals and object, ob objectives, um, it was hard for me to put together a comprehensive list of goals and objectives because I started working on this budget literally one week after I walked in the door. So I had real no, no real history, and you know, so so it was really hard. Um, one thing that did kind of jump out at me was um, the cash management software that we're using is pretty antiquated. It's not supported. Uh, there's no tech support. It's a little glitchy. It makes me a little nervous. <laughs> so um, that's one of my big goals for FY24 is, is um, upgrading the software, um, you know, to, to not only you know, get the tech support we need, but to also pres to preserve the data that we already have. Um, so that's one of my big goals. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more, but like I said, it's I'm kind of learning as I go here, so I will work with Anna to implement as we go along. Um, staffing changes for FY24 in this department. Um, I am very hopeful that we will be fully staffed uh, for the first time in six or seven months. Um, we did just finally hire a deputy treasurer who will be starting on Monday. Um, I have high hopes. He has a lot of ledger experience, a lot of banking experience, which are the two key um, you know, things I was looking for in making a hiring decision. Um, I do want to take the opportunity, since I have all of your attention, to just give a shout out to the two staff members that have been there um, working double and triple time to kind of pull you know, this all together and make sure that the work is getting done and, and processed. And, and they, they've, they've really been great. Um, so that would be the payroll coordinator, Caroline Nye, and the principal clerk, um, Elaine Cook. They, they're amazing team players. They've They've really, really come through. And they've been very patient during the transition and um, answering or helping to answer all of my questions. Um, I was trying to look back on the recent accomplishments. Again, it's hard because I wasn't there. But um, based on conversations I've had with my predecessor, um, I feel like payroll is one of the key points that she kept mentioning um, with the implementation of Munis tw version 2021. Um, we are able or are able and will be able to make uh, to streamline the payroll process, which is very important because there's just no it, where the city the city payroll is weekly. There's no break. There's no breathing time in between. You know, running the payrolls. So um, the process has been streamlined, and there's still a little bit more room for improvement there with with the payroll. So so I I, I feel like um, that's been one of the big uh, accomplishments that the treasurer's office has seen in FY twenty three. Um, any questions before we kind of look at the numbers? No? Okay. So just to jump in right to the um, general administrative expenses, um, the pretty much everything is the same except for two lines, which would be the tax foreclosure line and the credit card fee line. The tax foreclosure line, you'll see that it went down by 7,200, which was 100% of the budget. Um, we took that out because that is not really a city expense. Right, right. So we're going to be moving, we're going to be moving that to um, a revolving fund. Um, basically what this expense represents is money that we've collected from taxpayers that we're now paying out to attorneys. So it's not really a city expense. It kind of, the money kind of flows through the city. So we're moving it into a revolving fund to show all the ins and outs and hopefully it'll be, you know, everything that comes in should go out. Um, the 
Next biggest change was at credit card fees. Um, you can see that they, we've reduced the budget by $40,000 going forward. Um, this, these fees are generated from mostly from um, parking and permitting um, revenues for everybody you know who pays um, pay by play or the um, sorry I'm passports thank you <laughs> passports um, in in the parking garages in the kiosks and the meters this um, all the all the credit card money that comes in um, we're either charged a percentage by the merchant or even some merchants charge by transaction. Um, it's really hard to judge or how to predict how much parking revenue we're going to take in. Um, you know, a lot of it depends on the summertime and the, you know, the, the tourism and, and you can't, you know, the weather and <laughs> so many other factors. So, but, but looking at the trends, you know, going back, um, I don't, I don't know where FY23's number came from or how that was calculated, but I think it was a little high. So I feel comfortable after doing a complete analysis 10 times, um, that we can lower that, that expenditure by 40 grand. So that's what we've done. Yeah. Just to give a quick um, kudos to Kristen, I think she was here maybe two to three weeks and I went to her and said, hey, do you think we can get those credit card fees down in the budget because we're looking for savings? And she spent uh, many, many hours going through that to find a place that would be comfortable so that we could identify these savings for the budget next year. So kudos to Kristen. Thanks. Okay, moving on here now to, um, yeah, that's that's it for so why don't, why don't we pause? Why don't yeah. we pause in general admin, and we'll see if there's any questions before we get into fixed costs. Councilor Stott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great synopsis for only <laughs> jumping right in. Um, a, a question about the credit card fees. Mm -hmm. Something that has always kind of irked me, and I don't. We probably won't have an answer tonight. It's more of a philosophical question, but. When a user uses the Passport app, for example, I, the fee is paid for by the city, I believe. Mm -hmm. But when we the user goes to Salem.com to pay like a water bill or a utility bill mm -hmm. by credit card, the payee pays the fee. Mm -hmm. So I don't quite understand why we've made so, that decision. Um, I don't either. I mean, that's something that was made, um, a decision that was made from a prior administration, we can certainly pass the fees off onto the um, the citizen or the you know the the payer. That that's a decision you know that will have to be made on how we want to handle that um, going forward. But yes, I agree. Some some fees are absorbed by the city, and some fees are paid by the by the person whose whose credit card is being charged. If I may, thank you. I will just add my own two cents. See what I did there? Um, I, <laughs> I personally, I think the online bill pay should not have a, the fee passed on to the mm -hmm. payee. Um, it, it's always worked to me that it does. Mm -hmm. That's all. Um, sometimes, yeah, we could do like for the online processing, if we, you know, the e checks, maybe we could absorb the fee and then pass on the credit card fees or vice versa or something, you know, kind of make it like half and half or, yeah. They, they're, they're pretty high, the credit card fees. I agree. They, But people still will use their credit card to get those miles. So <laughs> sometimes it kind of, you know, it's okay to them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is a bit of a rub there, I have to say, having just paid my water sewer bill when you do the e-check, there is no fee. When you use your card, there mm -hmm. is a fee. Um, so it, even as a even as a user, it's not always equitable depending on what you're able to take access to. And with the Passport app, I'm, I recall us having conversations about moments where you know residents were free in this particular location at a certain time, and you as the payee are still paying a fee even when it's free. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the city may be paying a transaction fee on the other side. So like, there's something wonky that happens there where right. the merchant gets paid coming and going no matter what happens. Yeah, we can definitely look into that and, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say we could look into that. You know, when we say the city pays for it, it's us. It may, we're basically saying 
Salem property taxpayers are paying for. So there, there is a degree to which uh, the people that pay the parking meters, for example, are some residents, a lot not residents. So by the city subsidizing these fees, we're asking the taxpayers to subsidize a cost that is to the benefit of, not entirely, but to a certain extent, non-residents. Not, and that's not true so much with the water bills, for example, um, by definition. Council Merkel. Thank you, Chair McLean. Yes, just for my own understanding, uh, it's it's not an opinion about it, but that's that's a really good point. You know, we want to uh, make sure we're not subsidizing uh, visitors in that way, uh, but. If, and I, I, in my understanding, is credit cards both sides, as you said, get get charged. You know, when you, when you when you use a credit card. Um, but so let's say if if we were put passing that credit card fee on to you know our visitors, what does that look like? Does that mean like if we post um, parking is a dollar an hour, but then when they pay for their credit card, they'd get um, charged you know, a dollar and three percent of that. Is that what that would look like? So I then. Don't, yeah, definitely have to look into that a little bit more because there is a transaction fee for using the parking app. Um, I think it's 15 cents or something every time you park. But as far as the actual credit card char fees themselves, yeah, well, we're definitely going to have to look into that a little bit more. Okay, because it would be, I, I, like I said, I, I, do, I do support the concept. I just mm -hmm. wonder how it would be, uh, how confusing you know, right. it would end up. Right. You know, because yeah. it's, it's I know sometimes businesses will say, oh, they'll frame it as a 3% discount if you pay with a debit card, right. or they'll frame it as an extra mm -hmm. fee. Um, so it just can be confusing. Thank you. I agree. Okay, seeing nothing further on general admin, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move to approve the personnel budget in the amount of 287908 and the uh, expenditures budget in the amount of 127101 for a grand total of 4159. Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the Treasurer General Admin personnel budget in the amount of 287908, expenditures in the amount of 127,101 for a total of $415,009. Seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watsonfeld. Yes. And I am also a yes. Five, four, zero against. That carries. We'll move into fixed costs. Okay. So moving on to uh, general fund debt service. Um, let's see. So for the long term, debt, uh, principal and interest, you'll see that um, we have zeroed out a whole bunch of lines here on the um, budget, and we've kind of rolled everything rolled everything up into two lines, principal and interest. This is just for simplicity, um, just so you can see the bottom line. Um, we will still have the breakdown of these two lines. And the supporting schedules included. Are they attached to? Yeah, they're attached in the in the budget book. Um, they're just not here in this same position, same place. <laughs> just we just wanted to focus on the bottom line. Yep. So sorry. And just um, to follow up, the um, the long term debt service represents uh, the uh, the payments that the city is obligated to make um, for projects that have been previously authorized, uh, and these are the these are based on the schedules that we get uh, working with our financial advisors that assist with um, putting together the amortization schedules. And um, just to echo what Kristen was saying, it, it's best practice to actually have one principal line and one interest line and then supporting schedules, it's 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 actually very administratively burdensome to have all the lines in the budget laid out this way when we process the payments. And so this is to make it a much more efficient process internally. Where's the best place to locate that schedule in the budget oh, book? Um, it is in section six, I want to say. It's under the um, the entire, like our, our debt book 
the schedules are in there that show the payments by month. It's actually broken down even further that by this. It has uh, more detail on the, not full descriptions necessarily of the projects, but it has longer descriptions for the projects. It, it shows the monthly payments for uh, principal and interest for each project. Um, so that we felt this was also duplicating information elsewhere in the budget and was creating, it seemed a little bit hard to sort of assess what was actually um, in the debt portfolio uh, in terms of the appropriation line. Okay. So for the, the short term debt, which is basically, oh, Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. First time through. <laughs> We're doing it together. It's fine. <laughs> oh, sure. Yes. Um, and the long-term debt, um, which I just had up on my screen, is on page 510, which should be, it should be immediately behind um, the general admin in the same tab in the budget book, page 510. Got that pretty easy. I was, what I was flipping pages for was trying to locate the schedules that pertain to oh, the first few lines I happened to see, which were the school lines. Oh, apologies. I can, uh, bear with me one moment, I can give you the exact page numbers for those. And I'm looking in, I'm looking in financial forecast plans and policies, which seems to have a lot of the aggregate debt service included in it. Yes. Uh, the long-term debt service by month, I believe, starts on page 262 in tab 6. And the, and the um, when I say tab 6, uh, big tab 6, color-coded tab 6. And it's, I think it's about 80 pages worth of debt schedules in there for anyone that is yeah, there's inclined. <laughs> there's quite a bit. Big tabs and little tabs. Have we expressed our gratitude for this giant book? I think we have. <laughs> Thanks for this giant book. <laughs> Okay, does anybody have any actual questions about the long-term debt service? Councilor Appworth? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, long-term debt in the amount of $8,560,828. Mr. Councilor Hapworth motions to recommend approval of long-term debt service in the amount of $8,560,828. Seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth? Yes. Councilor Merkel? Yes. Councilor Stott? Yes. And Councilor Watson Felt? Yes. I am also a yes, five, four, zero against. That carries. We'll move on to the short-term debt service. Okay, for the short-term debt, um, this is debt that we borrow for short-term, um, usually less than a year. It's borrowed to fund immediate project costs um, without interrupting like the regular cash flow. Um, so, so we borrow this temporarily until we put more permanent financing through, which would be the long-term debt. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out here, and you will see almost a $300,000 decrease in the short-term debt, which is amazing. Um, we did some, Anna and I did some research and analysis on this and found that a lot of the lease payments um, for both the streetlight conversion and some of the vehicle leases had been paid in full. And so we were able to just completely take those off and hopefully not renew those. <laughs> um, so, so that's a, that's a big decrease there. Um, and then that's about it for, for the short, short term, yeah, short term, <laughs> I could say it. <laughs> And just to potentially add a point of clarification on the lease payments, the the comments that are in there, um, I don't think have been updated for a couple of years. And so that's why it looks like it's saying principal payment one of three and principal payment year five of seven. It should actually say principal payment three of three and principal payment seven of seven, uh, which is when we confirmed that I, that was my happiest day this spring. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I love to see numbers go down in the budget. Um, I will say that 
just looking at this relative to the last section that the budget lines in here are much more digestible, right? It's much easier to look at these and get a sense of what we were actually paying for than it was in the long-term debt where it's like heavily coded. Um, I know that's something that sort of happens early in the process, but it would be great to see those become more digestible too. Seeing no questions or comments, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the short-term debt service in the amount of 280503. Councilor Hapworth motions to recommend approval of the short-term debt service expenditure in the amount of 280503 seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor watson felt Yes. I am also a yes. Five four zero against. That carries. Essex Tech and vocational assessment. Um, yes. So the tech assessment is based off of the number of enrollees, which I have not had a chance to see what the current year enrollees are. However, the amount billed is what is shown here. And as you can see, compared to last year, it has decreased by 35,000, um, but has basically remained at about 2.5 for the last few years. Seeing no questions or comments about that, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the Essex Tech and Vocational Assessment in the amount of 2,565,518. Second. Councilor Hapworth motions to recommend approval of the Essex Tech and Voc Assessment expenditures in the amount of 2,565,518. Seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson felt. Yes. I am also a yes. Five four. The matter carries. Okay. For cherry sheet. Cherry sheets. Um, let's see. The cherry sheet assessments. Those did go up quite a bit for um, the schools mostly school choice and charter schools. Uh, the assessments are paid. Um, as an offset to the revenue. Um, let me see. So yeah, so that's gonna show as a 400, almost 500,000 just on the schools side and they increase on the schools. Yes, please do. And just to add one, uh, one note here, uh, the state assessments that are reflected in this budget proposal are preliminary numbers because the state is not yet done has not yet finalized their FY24 budget and so we won't get fully finalized uh, state assessment numbers until over the summer um, whatever they are we are obligated to pay them um, and so typically what we do is we budget the more conservative numbers that we get from the state usually they're somewhat consistent between the governor the house and the senate sometimes they vary a little bit um, and so uh, that's just a note that if, if one were to compare exactly what was in the budget for 23 and what we ultimately pay at the end of the year, it might be there might be some slight differences based on how, how things came together with the final budget um, for, for any, any given year. And this is also just to, to flag where um, I think during the school's budget presentation, there were some notes about the, the level state aid. And uh, while the Chapter 70 on the revenue side looked great, um, the charter reimbursement um, was created a challenging dynamic um, on that side. Councilor Marcello. Thank you, Chair. I had a lot of questions here just because I need to understand more about what these are for. Um, so I did notice that the special ed went way down. Um, what is that actually for? Uh, yeah. I brought my. Um, I brought my cherry sheet manual with me because every year there are certain ones of these that no matter how many times I, I, I read them, they won't lodge in my brain. So for the um, the special education, that reimbursement I believe is based off of um, I believe it's based off of the the number of students. Bear with me one second while I find this is one of the ones I look at all the time. Where 
versus me. Why am I not doing this? Oh, there it is. Oh, apologies. I just want to make sure I'm giving you the exact definition of this and not what is in my memory. Charter schools, I can explain off the top of my head. Um, so this, um, it, to reimburse, this is to reimburse the state for, for providing special needs education to children enrolled in state hospital schools. Um, so the, the formula is the charge, the cost that each municipality is charged is the average per pupil cost of education within the school district multiplied by the full-time equivalent of resident pupils served by the state. Um, and current year charges are for uh, pupils served in the prior school year. There's a little bit more detail, but that's the overall formula. And the formulas for us, for most of these are, are very wonky. Um, but that is, yeah, so it's it's the number of pupils and then charged by the um, the cost that, and, and the change in the cost would impact the, the assessment that we have to pay. So, okay. Yep, I can, okay. we can try to, we can I, break it down. <laughs> I, so we had fewer students in this position last year and that's why the assessment went down? My assumption is yes, in that the cost of each, I would have to go back and check and see what the backup is that they have for that they, I can go online and dig into the sheet, but it would, I won't be able to do that quickly right now. Um, but if it is the cost that we are charged, the average pupil cost of education, which of course that has only gone up, uh, multiplied by the FTE equivalent of resident pupils served by the state, that must have gone down uh, because otherwise, I, I don't know how the formula would work otherwise, but I will go in and check the detail on that and, okay. and confirm that with you. Okay. Um, the RMV non-renewal surcharge, I guess that's what that is. Oh, my favorite. You know that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so... Basically, um, when we send out excise tax bills every year, um, for those who don't pay, um, after I think it's 30 days, we do what's called a mark with the uh, Registry of Motor Vehicles, and we charge them $20. That mark is paid directly to the Registry of Motor Vehicles, but then paid back to the city on the cherry, through the cherry sheets, um, or adjusted on the cherry sheets, I should say. So um, let's see. Go ahead. Yeah, go the, ahead. Um, so the, and this is up to something that the collector mentioned in her presentation related to the, that, what's called the mark. Um, the, that can be from, so the upcoming fiscal year actual assessments are based on the non renewal obligations cleared in the pri prior fiscal year. So the ones that are got cleaned up, the obligations cleared in the current fiscal year may be for markings from several fiscal years. And so it's not always a, a just one year look back, it can be multiple years. And so basically whatever's clearing, that's what we're then uh, paying back because we were, that money came to us and we need to return that. Did I say that? No. Yeah, no, you're right. I have, I'm sorry. Yeah. I had a question. Yeah, the, the municipality collects a $20 surcharge per violation for non-payment. And then, so when, when um, the collector was mentioning that uh, types of things that they collect, she mentioned that they collect this $20 surcharge, which is called the, the marking mm -hmm. uh, for non-payment. That surcharge then provides the municipality, um, th this enables the municipality to offset the $20 charge per marking assessed by the RMV. So it's intended to be a net neutral for the, um, for the, for the, for the municipality, but so the person who's not paying though, they are ultimately charged that fee. So we, we take that in because they didn't, um, it's not intended. It's not intended for us to retain the funds. It's more intended to go to the RMB, basically. So twenty bucks is what you're saying. Yeah. So if we divide that number by twenty dollars, that's the number of people that did not pay their excise tax. Oh, yeah, yeah. I. So so if somebody who hasn't had their license for five years mm -hmm. um, because they were non-renewable because of the marks um, comes in and says, "All right, I got to clean up all my old excise tax bills, um, so I can get my license. I have a new job. I need my license. I need to be able to drive." These fees can go back decades. Okay. So we could be collecting fees from 1990, okay. 2000. You know. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very hard to we can't we can't say these. What is it? A hundred and where the fees goes, uh, oh, 20,000, 18,000, sorry. <laughs> the 18,000, oh, it was 137. 
it was a change of 18,000. So the $137,000 in fees doesn't represent one specific fiscal year. It could represent, like I said, decades of, yep. of collection, you know, okay. collections, very okay. sporadic. We, you know, it's, it's okay. hard to keep track of, yep. but so you're just reimbursing through, them for their money that that okay. we've collected. Yes, okay. I'm sorry, I said that backwards earlier. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, uh, it's not what they've collected paying to us; it's what we've collected and and are paying out to the registry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know if you can do this, but the two school related ones, the the out of district and the charter school, you can't really look at those numbers and determine whether there's more kids because the assessments may have increased, right, per student. Yes. Um, so that's the, uh, the charter one I think is probably the most complicated out of all of these. Um, it, the, the charter school formula, it's not necessarily that there are more kids. It's where they are because the formula is the 100 for the first year, 60 mm -hmm. for the second year, 40% the third year. Mm -hmm. And because I believe the city's seats are capped. And so technically there really should be a stable number of students, um, enrolled in charter schools. It just depends on what that cycle is with students cycling right. through the formula. And so it, it's, I think it's likely, um, appropriate to assume it's a stable number of students, but it's both the, co the, the, the underlying uh, foundation budget increasing, which we have to then pass along, um, and then just where they are in the, their their education years. Okay. But the out of district one is based on that. That one does appear to be based entirely on is a much cleaner formula um, mm -hmm. than the um, than the than the charter school assessment. Yeah, I, I just wonder if you could maybe provide a little bit more data with those two, since sure. it is like a. I think that those also are used a lot when people throw around numbers about students leaving the yeah. district. And, oh. and yeah, I, I, I don't know how you would do it for the charter schools, but I, there's got to be a way to do that, that we're, we're at our cap or we're below the cap, whatever, um, how many students are choosing to go there. So, and I just realized I sort of explained this thinking on the revenue side because that's where my brain goes automatically. But the um, on the chart, on the actual assessment side, that that one... Does, it, it doesn't matter in the assessments. It's more on the revenue reimbursement side where it matters where we are in the step down formula. But the, on the assessment side, it is number of students. Um, it doesn't matter where they are in the step down. It's number of students. However, um, and this requires more research on my end because I've actually had some questions on this. Um, it, it appears sometimes that the state, I, I've had questions about how they're snapshotting the enrollment numbers because technically one would assume um, that the budgets presented by the governor, the House, and the Senate all would be using the same enrollment snapshots. So there wouldn't be a reason necessarily for the assessment number to change, but it has changed through each iteration this year. It changed, it, it does toggle a bit. And so I do have some questions and research to do on my end to understand a little bit more why that component is toggling if we are using the same snapshot of students. Um, so I can, I can certainly do some re research on that and figure out how we might better reflect that um, in a budget document. Okay, thank you. Seeing nothing further on the charity sheet, Councilor Epworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the state assessments budget in the amount of ten thousand three fifty-two two. Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the state assessments expenditures in the amount of ten million three hundred and fifty-two thousand and two. Seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson felt. Yes. I am also a yes. That's five in favor. The matter carries. The state will get theirs. Contributory retirement. So for the retirement expenditures, um, we currently have um, 1,080 active um, employees contributing and 748 retired um, collecting. Um, so the, the total amount this year is that we budgeted is for for FY24 is 
this has gone up three and a half percent from prior years, and I think it's pretty standard every year, right? Anna, if you want to um, yeah. I can add a little bit to this. Uh, so the the appropriation request for the contributory retirement is based off of the funding schedule um, in order to um, achieve uh, full funding currently projected to be 2032. Um, the funding schedule goes up five and a half percent annually. The reason uh, the request um, in front of you is three and a half percent is that upon further evaluation, reviewing the appropriation, there are there are areas in the budget where we are able to charge um, associated fringe costs of you know for example the uh, the North Shore WIB employees that are technically they're they're paid through the city but they are technically not they're the city is not obligated to be paying for their retirement they are being paid off of often federal grants and so they we are able to charge portions of the assessment associated with those staff to those grants and so I did a very deep dive on this to find a more accurate representation of what the obligation would be next year uh, just to make sure that we weren't that we weren't turning back funds unnecessarily at the end of FY24. Thank you for that. Seeing no questions or comments, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the contributory retirement budget for the amount of $14,930,794. Is there Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the contributory retirement budget in the total of $14,930,794. Seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. I am also a yes. It's five in favor. The matter carries. And then um, I'll assist Kristen with the non-contributory pensions because I'm not sure that she's familiar with this yet. Um, uh, this is currently for one individual uh, that was grandfathered into an arrangement uh, where the city um, is paying uh, the full cost for their retirement. And so this is the this has been a stable appropriation for the last several years, and we're anticipating this the same cost for 24. Seeing no questions or comments, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the non-contributory pensions budget in the amount of $10,625. Councilor Hapworth recommends approval of the non-contributory pensions budget in the total amount of $10,625, seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. I'm also a yes. Five in favor of the Medicare. Medicare. So for the Medicare expenditures, um, this is for the city share of the Medicare contributions. Um, it's basically a match uh, based on the number of employees and their contributions. So from everybody's check, you see you get what you pay out one point four. 5% in Medicare contributions, the city matches that, pays it in. Um, the number's gone up a little bit this year because we've settled a lot of contracts and we're paying back um, retro pay. So there's naturally gonna be some increases every year on the Medicare. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean. This question might be directed to the new elected mayor. Are you? I know you, you inherited this uh, budget, but does you have any plan to increase your personnel based on these Medicare numbers so the, the projection can be more accurate? Not at this time. Great, thank you. It's up to you. Yeah, I, I just elaborate to say, you know, it's premature to say what, what I'm going to suggest for FY25, but right now this is the, the budget that we're dealing with. So this is the personnel levels that we're anticipating. Seeing nothing further, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the Medicare budget in the amount of 1382574 
Council Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the Medicare budget in the total of 1,382,574, seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth? Yes. Councilor Merkel? Yes. Councilor Stott? Yes. Councilor Watson Felt? Yes. I am also a yes. That's five in favor. The matter carries. Municipal insurance. Um, this I'm going to defer to Anna. <laughs> I can take this one. Um, so this is the non-medical insurance uh, that the city is obligated to provide. So this is for uh, professional liability, uh, property coverage, um, auto. I think I'm missing a few. Um, and within this also includes any deductibles that we pay out for those coverage lines. There are also similar lines in the water and sewer fund uh, to afford deductibles associated with um, um, sewer backups or, or water main breaks, et cetera. So this is based off of the premium uh, that we uh, receive from Maya, our insurer, and assume some contributions, um, I believe from the, from the school to assist in offsetting the cost because the, the, portion, the appropriation is occurring on the, uh, the city side of the budget. And then there's a we charge that that portion back to the back to the school, and they've budgeted. They have budgeted consistently with what we reflect in the budget detail um, uh, for this section. Seeing no comments or questions, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the municipal insurance budget in the amount of three thirty five three ninety seven. Council Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the municipal insurance expenditures budget in the amount of 335397 which is also the total. Councilor Hapworth? Yes. Councilor Merkel? Yes. Councilor Stott? Yes. Councilor Watson Felt? Yep. And I'm a yes. That's 5 4. The matter carries. I think we're now on to the um, sewer enterprise fund as there are several lines um, in both sewer and water that the treasurer manages. Uh, I believe um, page 826 is the SESD assessment, which I think is the first item. I'm pulling it up myself right now. And I believe that's tab 28. I'm gonna double check that page number. Yes, page 826. Um, so this is um, this is the assessment that is paid uh, by the South Essex, Essex Sewer, Sewerage Board um, for our portion of the cost of operations and maintenance and debt service uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. And there's a formula that they go through and they um, provide us um, with a letter annually that informs us of what their assessment is intended to be based on uh, what the budget that the board there has voted for the upcoming year. And so for ne next year, our assessment um, is decreasing um, almost Seeing no question to comments, Councilor Abworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the uh, SESD assessment in the amount of four million seven thirty one six fifteen. Councilor Hapworth recommends approval of the SESD assessment in the amount of four million seven hundred and thirty one thousand six hundred and fifteen, seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. I am also a yes. That carries. Sewer enterprise long-term debt. So with the sewer debt, um, we this is the long-term debt. Again, that was previously approved uh, for capital projects for the sewer enterprise fund. Um, we took the same approach here that we did with the general fund and where we rolled up all the separate projects into one principal line and one interest line. Um, that's but otherwise, there was no significant increases or decreases for FY24.
And just in case this is helpful for those that are interested, uh, the water and sewer debt is located in the same um, same debt book section in section six, if, if folks are interested in looking at that in more detail. Big tab six. Okay. Seeing no questions or comments, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the Sioux Enterprise long term debt in the amount of $1,722,592. Okay. Councilor Hapworth recommends approval of the sewer long term debt expenditure in the amount of $1,722,592, seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councillor Stott? Yes. Councillor Watson felt? Yes. I am also a yes. That's five in favor. Carries. Sewer Enterprise short term debt. So, with the short term debt, um, there was a little bit of an increase, but nothing um, too outrageous. This um, debt will also be rolled into long term debt come FY24. I may just add uh, for the committee, um, something that we're closely monitoring on our end is that our short-term notes that we're, we're, we actually just issued um, a week and a half ago um, that will be permanently financed in November. When we issued notes last June, I believe we were getting interest rates around 2% and the notes we just issued, the rates are up closer to 5%. And so we actually borrowed less, but the interest increased even though we borrowed less. And so that was challenging. And so we'll keep a close eye on that. And just so, just so I know that I'm reading this correctly, um, I know we've had some other places in the schedules where lines were artificially separated, for lack of a better word, because of change in text. Is that what's happening here? Or are these actual different categories? No, that's exactly what's happening. OK. Yeah. Seeing no comments or questions, Councilor Hepworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the Sewer Enterprise short term debt budget in the amount of 51414 Councilor Hepworth recommends approval of the sewer short term debt in the amount of 51414 seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hepworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. Yes. I am also a yes. That's five in favor. That carries. Insurance deduction. So for the sewer ins insurance deductions, or the de deductibles, excuse me, um, we did increase this number going forward into FY24 based off of um, a lot of claims that were put in um, in FY23. We do need to do a little bit of further analysis on this and find out why the numbers actually doubled. But, um, but, you know, for, in all fairness, we had to, <laughs> had to increase the number to, to reflect the actual, you know, proposed amounts. I wish Ray, I wish Ray was still here to ask the question. But seeing no comments or questions right now, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the Sewer Enterprise Insurance Deduction in the amount of $10,000. Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the Sewer Enterprise Insurance Deductible in the amount of $10,000, seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. I am also a yes. That's five in favor. It carries.
Um, next up in water in tab 29, starting on page 850, is treasurer long-term debt. Page 850. So with the uh, water enterprise long-term debt, um, kind of following the same um, rule as we did with Sewer and general fund, we're rolling up all the individual projects into two lines, principal and interest. All the individual schedules um, are in the back of the book. I forget what page number they are, but they're right behind the other ones. So they should all be together, right, Anna? Yeah. Seeing no comments or questions, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the Water Enterprise long-term debt in the amount of two million three thirty-three one sixty-seven. Councilor Hapworth recommends a, makes a motion to recommend approval of water long-term debt in the amount of two million three hundred and thirty-three thousand one hundred and sixty-seven. Seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson felt. Yes. I'm also a yes. That's five in favor. The matter carries. Short term debt. With the short term debt uh, for the water enterprise fund, uh, you can see that we, we did borrow an additional 50, or, or I should say, <laughs> we're going to be paying out an additional 50 in interest. Um, I'm going to let Anna speak on this a little bit. Um, just that that increase likely does it, it is a large increase compared to last year. The only the reason it, it it's a significant increase is just because the um, composition of what was water and what was sewer when we um, in terms of the expenditures that have occurred for the relevant projects happened to skew more water versus sewer. And so when we issued the projects, we allocate those out very specifically what's sewer and what's water. So that's why this went up a bit more compared to last year. It's just the project where the project spending happened to occur during FY23. Seeing no comments or questions, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recommend approval of the Water Enterprise short term debt in the amount of 72278 Councilor Hapworth motions to recommend approval of the Water Enterprise short term debt in the amount of 72278 Seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. I am also a yes. That's five in favor. Um, and uh, next up is the Salem Beverly Water Board. Uh, sorry, Salem Salem Beverly Water Supply Board assessment. And so, similar similarly to the SESD assessment, um, the board determines uh, the volume of water supplied to the cities um, of Salem and Beverly during the three years prior to September 30th, and then that establishes the proportion on which the cities uh, then pay for their expenses toward the water board for the upcoming year. And I just noticed that um, I neglected to update the assessment number in the text, but down below in the chart is the accurate number, um, a little over 3 million, an increase of just under 4% for next year. Seeing no comments or questions, Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to rec recommend approval of the Sal Salem Beverly Water Supply Board assessment in the amount of three million seventeen thousand three hundred thirty-six dollars. Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the Salem Beverly Water Supply Board expenditure in the amount of three million seventeen thousand three hundred thirty-six. Seconded by Councilor Stott. 
Councilor Hapworth? Yes. Councilor Merkel? Yes. Councilor Stott? Yes. Councilor Watson Felt? Yes. I am also a yes. That is five in favor. Yep, so moving on to what I think is the last of the treasurer's budget is the water enterprise insurance deductibles. <clears throat> These two, as you can see, have doubled um, for FY24, again, due to claims for city at, at fault, water backups. Um, um, again, you know, we, I think Anna and I are I have to I have to take a really close look and and see what happened in FY twenty three, um, and and you know are are we sure that this is going to continue to happen throughout the you know FY twenty four? Seeing no comments or questions, Councilor Hapworth. Hey, Mr. Chair, I'd like to recommend approval. Sorry, Chair, can I ask, ask one question? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, where or, or are we seeing anywhere on the budget um, where there might be income recouped from losses if we then go on to seek reimbursement from a failing of a third party contractor? Where does that appear? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. <laughs> I think I think it. I think it depends. I believe um, we were just actually looking at this last week, the two of us. Um, I believe we. I believe it's general fund miscellaneous receipts. Um, but I that that was the assessment that we looked at. That was the first time I had seen that in my time here. And so we um, all revenue is general general fund revenue unless otherwise stated in statute. So um, it was in it was allocated to our miscellaneous receipts. But there's no other tracking that would that you that you do in your files to kind of um, be able to say a loss ended up being a net zero to the city. There's no no process for that. I, we can certainly look at and see. On my end, I haven't maintained an active tracking of that, but I believe that the former treasurer may have been uh, maintaining some information on that. And so Kristen and I are looking through to to determine what's the most effective way to to look at this since this is it's interesting that we we just looked at this the other day. Um, so uh, I, your point um, about uh, tracking it, uh, we definitely take that to heart and um, we'll ensure that if something isn't happening now that it that it is happening going forward. Yeah, I I think that's great. And th thanks for validating that. I, I would suggest so because I know, especially with water-based losses or water main losses, these are not cheap losses. They are a, a great cost to the city and they hit our insurance. So um, I also know that we do a lot of subcontracting. I think it would be great for the public's level of transparency and awareness to know what kind of, of, um, of um, work we're doing on their behalf to recoup some of that. Thank you. We could potentially put that as a performance measure for next year. That would be great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. This time, really seeing no questions or comments. <laughs> Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the water enterprise insurance deductibles in the amount of $5,000. Council Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the Water Enterprise Insurance Deductible in the amount of $5,000, seconded by Councilor Stott. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Markle. Yes. Councilor Stott. Yes. Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. I'm also a yes. It's five in favor. I think that's it for me, so thank you all very much. Thank you. Nice. Hope you had fun at your first budget hearing with us. <laughs> Council on Aging, please join us. Hi, everybody. I'm Teresa Arnold. For those of you who don't know me, and I'm the Council on Aging Director for the City of Salem. Thank you for having me. 
I think most of you know the gist of what we do, but I'd really like to um, just read our mission statement really quickly. Um, the mission of the Salem COA is to develop and offer inclusive programs for all seniors 60 and older and younger disabled residents of Salem, regardless of their race, faith, cult faith culture, gender, identity, or sexuality, that affirm life and independence, challenge creativity, enhance social isolation, and promote spiritual, psychological, and physical wellness. Although most programs and services are offered at the Community Life Center, the Salem Council on Aging is also committed to serving the needs of the homebound, socially isolated, and culturally diverse older adults and younger disabled individuals of Salem. So I really think that says it all. We revised this statement maybe a year and a half ago, um, I think to be more in line with being inclusive and, and looking at the whole community. And I think the board did a good job on, on uh, uh, redoing this. For those of you who don't know what we do, I think um, some of the major programs are social services for sure. And I know a lot of you have heard me in the past talk about the great work the social work team did during the pandemic and uh, meeting the needs of the general community and particularly working with the Board of Health um, to serve the homebound with vaccinations and obviously working with the mayor's office and others. But uh, the social workers on a day-to-day -day basis do things like navigate health insurance, that's, it's a big maze when people are turning 65, but also if people are just looking to make changes. We see most vulnerable. Uh, we see uh, people who are being evicted, homeless, uh, on the verge of homelessness. Uh, we help people with social security and housing applications, working very closely with the housing authority here in the city. We identify those who are socially isolated, ref refer people to counseling, and our folks, our social workers, have vast knowledge of all of the social services in, ta in the community, Greater North Shore. Uh, the social workers are not clinical social workers. They don't offer mental health counseling, but they are your best resource people in town. Uh, we also work with AARP each year to offer um, free tax assistance to elders and others, too. Uh, usually it's, it's mostly the seniors. That's in a nutshell of, of what the social service team does. I wanted to mention along the line of social services, and I didn't put it in for this year, but it's becoming more apparent to me that there will be a need for a mental health clinician going forward. Um, we brought that up at the debate um, in, in May, and I think all will agree that uh, due to social isolation and just what's going on in this world, that all populations um, are in need of more mental health assistance. I would seek next year coming to you, at least a, a part-time mental health clinician at the center. So I just plant that seed now. Uh, transportation is a wonderful service. Uh, it, we, you know, Salem's a tough city to drive in, as we know. And even though some of our folks still drive, they love our vans. We have a fleet of six vans and eight part-time van drivers. And what a great service. We get people to and fro to the center uh, primarily to medical appointments, that's very important, and uh, grocery shopping. So those basic human needs being filled. And also, each weekday we go to a different neighboring community. So if people have a specialist, they can get to their specialist. So it's a good service. We saw in May 13 one-way rides, uh, 1,300 one-way rides, and we increased it uh, that you were eligible for three if we could accommodate you, and that's helping people come to the center, get to appointments, and, and go home. So we're trying to do what we can for folks. About 325 to 350 people typically use our unduplicated uh, use the service. Dining services is growing. I know I've mentioned that many times. Um, we have one dining services coordinator with a vast background in the field of hospitality and restaurants. And uh, we've added uh, past year a little continental breakfast every morning. We keep an eye out for people who may be food insecure, but also it's just a nice thing to do to welcome our guest, Erica Blumberg, who's our coordinator, refers to folks as our guest, our dining guest. That makes people feel good and uh, welcome. So we, we have volunteers that help Erica, and we serve them coffee, give them a little light breakfast if they, if they would like that. And then they oversee the congregate meal program Monday through Friday. So we work with AgeSpan. AgeSpan is the Area Aging Service Access Point, or AAA. And uh, there's one in every 
every area, down in my neck of the woods in Gloucester, there's senior care. We were under North Shore Elder Services, merged with uh, Merrimack Valley. It's now called AgeSpan. They're the home care agency in our area. We contract with them for a small grant for uh, nutrition and a small grant for transportation. But it's a partnership of, of sorts. And I would, you know, kind of going back to social services, they serve homebound when we refer. We serve homebound known to us, and our social workers will do home visits. But we work closely with AgeSpan because those are the agencies that will supply the um, the bathing, the dressing, the, the cleaning of the apartment, and those kinds of things. So just in terms of keeping the homebound in mind. And when we know somebody's food insecure, we'll work with various agencies to make sure they're getting food. And the Meals on Wheels Home Delivered Meals program is a huge hit, and that's out of age span. They use the CLC space. Marblehead and Salem drivers meet each morning, get their root sheets, their meals, and then off they go to uh, bring the homebound their lunches. And we, we coordinate with them, again, to make sure no one is food insecure. We try really hard to identify those people that might need added services and more food. Let's see. Um, programs and activities. You know, a lot of people think a council on aging is all fun and games. Um, well, we do have that, you know. Um, but like I mentioned, social services and transportation. But to the, the other pieces, programs and activities, lots of them are lots of fun. Uh, we have uh, meditation, yoga, Zumba, all kinds of dance. We work with physical therapists in the area to come in and do balance classes. Uh, we, we do chair yoga. So we're really, as part of our mission statement, promoting wellness on every level. And, you know, some people come once a week, some people come five, t five times a week. And, um, you know, we're, we're offering connection in one form or another, whether it's programs and activities or it's that meal program. Uh, we are a welcoming place and growing. T Teresa, will you just speak a little closer into the microphone, Oh, sure. Please? Yep. That's, uh, oh, it's, everyone says that. I have a soft voice. Um, uh, I think people know we have a fitness center that's open. It's free. Uh, we have a volunteer who mans the room just in case somebody has some kind of a spell. And uh, we have other other uh, groups that come in and we host them, like book clubs, positive aging discussion groups. Uh, we do have blood pressure clinics. And then, of course, our legislators come in, Senator Lovely, Rep Cruz, Julio Mota from uh, Mayor Pangalo's office. We also offer wellness lectures on special special programs on a regular basis. We work with the health department and have a once a month wellness walk on the common, and it's led by maybe one of you, a community influencer, somebody who can tell a story about what they're doing for the city. I think Councillor Watson felt uh, was the lead walker one time, and uh, we'll probably tap you all. But uh, just, you know, fun things to keep people moving and active. And we have some lovely partnerships with Salem State University, and how lucky are we to have Salem State right here. I uh, work very closely with the nursing department. They come in um, during the course of the academic year. They come once a week. And they offer uh, classes or demonstrations like fall, falls prevention, blood pressure clinics, uh, how to read nutrition labels, and things like that. And it's such a win-win having students come in interacting with our seniors who oftentimes love to share their stories. And the young students are always very interested in that. So that intergenerational component is, is pretty touching. And uh, I think it meets everybody's need. We also work with nursing students from North Shore Community College, OT students and professors at Salem State. And we've worked with the Health Sciences Department in the past too. So those are great collaborations and uh, we, we continue them. Uh, one program I'm very proud of is the Memory Cafe, which I've mentioned in the past. And the Memory Cafe, um, a Memory Cafe is a welcoming place for anybody who's living with any level of forgetfulness as well as their caregiver. There's no real rules to it, but it's a place where people going through this experience, whether the caregiver or the person experiencing some level of dementia, can feel welcome and safe. 
So we have a facilitator who will bring in, uh, you know, a musician. We might do a name that tune kind of thing. We might do a pottery class. Uh, the Memory Cafe folks help to take care of our raised vegetable beds outside, uh, kind of on the Boston Street side of the center. And it's really to keep folks uh, who are going through this experience engaged with the community and again, feeling safe with others going through the same thing. And it's kind of taking off all over the place. It started in the Netherlands, I think in the late 90s, went across Europe and then finally to the US. So we've quite a few around the area and we have a, a really great one. Um, there was funding about two years ago that came to us from then Representative Tucker. It was an additional grant from the Executive Office of Elder Affairs and this has helped us fund this. And then I'm going to be looking to the regular state formula grant from Elder Affairs to keep it going. It's worth, you know, keeping going and, and funding. Uh, just as a note, tomorrow we're having a certified dementia practitioner come in, um, offering a program called Dementia and Caregiving, Your Questions Answered. And we've got about 25 people signed up for that. And there was a little piece in the paper, I think, this morning. Um, so excited about that as well. I wanted to just let you know that uh, technology is important to us to make it equitable and accessible for our seniors, uh, particularly our low-income folks who might not be able to afford a laptop um, so or an iPad. So I just submitted a grant to um, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, and we partnered with the Lynn Council on Aging. Um, they, ex they had a pilot program in Lynn, so we were tapped, and... The grant can go up to $100,000 for each council on aging. We may not get that amount, but it will allow us to purchase uh, iPads, someone to train folks, and free internet service for a year. And this is because we're a gateway city, we were targeted for this, and it's, it's a really good thing. So I'm hoping that we will get that funding. If not, HBAN just donated about half dozen computers to us, and we can at least o uh, reopen up a computer lab, which I believe happened long before me at the, the COA, but it's important. Um, so I wanted to let you know that. And um, just touching upon a few of the goals and objectives, um, I mentioned Salem State and the work we do with them, and they do with us. I want to just mention the kitchen at the Community Life Center. Uh, we've been working on this for a while, and um, there's a, a committee, if you will, and it was led by Mike Lichikowski and then Joe Candelaria, our facilities manager, uh, who has now become the point person uh, because Mike left and, and Mr. St. Pierre left. Uh, so uh, we're it. And so we have a few folks, uh, John Russell, who's active both on the board and the friends, uh, Joe, Erica, who is our dining services uh, person, myself and a few others working with um, Russo Barr, who's been engaged to do the schematics and uh, working with Anthony Delaney. We're just um, getting going on our first payment. This is ARPA funded, and then uh, for 140000 and thirty, I committed about 30000 from the state formula grant to fund the kitchen. I may be going back and asking for more ARPA funds because that's the way of the world. The process was slowed down because we did have stops and starts, but I think we're, we're on a roll again. I'd like to say a year out that we're doing more in the kitchen and more self-cook. We will have a vent, a confection oven, and we'll be able to do more of more of this, in addition to the congregate meals, which is an entitlement program. Those are free with a voluntary donation. We will have to charge for what we cook ourselves, but it'll be low cost, it'll be a cafe, there'll be healthy options for not only the seniors, but the city staff and the general community, which I know it was former Mayor Driscoll's vision to, to fill the center um, food draws. So in addition to our seniors, we'd like to see more people coming in during the day and making that area a community cafe. So it's been baby steps, but I do see it happening. So that's a real goal. Um, let's see. I mentioned the Memory Cafe to continue to grow that. What spun out of the Memory Cafe is a caregiver support group. So once a month we have a 
uh, caregiver support group that's well attended. Back in March, we held a caregiver retreat at Winter Island where these caregivers received Reiki treatments, a lovely lunch from Root, um, a flower arranging class, and, and it was a session. It was a support group meeting as well. But these are the kinds of things we're doing to serve those components of the community. Uh, let's see. I know that's a lot. I just want to mention that the Friends of the Council on Aging is our fundraising arm, as you know. And they're an active group led by Andrew LaPointe. And the Friends are great. They do an annual appeal. They raise money in other kinds of ways. They help us sometimes to defray the cost of instructors or what we charge for classes, or occasionally um, enable a class to be offered for free. A big thing that the Friends do um, is offer Thanksgiving and Easter meals to homebound folks. And these are folks who really can't get out, have no one around, and uh, I think the best part is the person dropping off the meal is rewarded, and we might be the only person that that homebound senior sees that day. So the friends do that for Easter and Thanksgiving. It's very successful. Um, and just mentioning that we do have a very strong Council on Aging board. And since I got here almost six years ago, at my first meeting, I remember they were talking about ADUs and more affordable and subsidized housing for our seniors. And that is their number one mission, is more subsidized housing for seniors. And I know that we all share that challenge uh, for all age groups. In terms of the budget, um, yes, we've gone up a bit, but uh, prices are rising when it comes to uh, when we do our self-cook food. Contracted services is always um, hard to figure. We share the contracted services of the Community Life Center with Park and Rec, and so we work together to forecast what we should project. Um, various contracts are uh, multi-year, uh, some single year, but we're, we're maintaining the grounds, we're you know, maintaining the elevator, um, and, and those kinds of things that really um, our facilities manager is in charge of. With our fleet of vehicles, they're getting older, so we always assess to say what's worth keeping, just like our own car, how much money do you want to put in it, into it? Um, so um, we, we forecast about the same each year for vehicle parts and accessories, because we just don't know with a vehicle what's going to happen. Um, not too much drastic changes in the operational piece as far as I can see. I will mention dues and subscriptions went up a bit because our mass council on aging dues went up to $1,800. And then we do take a, a few other smaller memberships. Something as simple as uh, subscribing to the Salem News because our social work team tracks obituaries so we can be in touch with families. And what I want to do is I want to know what's going on in the city that I work in, particularly housing. So to us, that's that's worth having. Um, and then some other minor things as well. Um, I know there was the uh, normal 2% cost of living, and then I was informed, uh, I think by Anna and HR, there was some salary surveys done too, um, I guess this past year, past several months. So there are a few staff that um, just to make their salaries equitable with their peers in the field, neighboring communities, men have gotten a 3%. There was one 5% raise to bring someone up who was very low, uh, a, the new, a newer staff member, but now uh, needs to be brought up um, with area peers. So it's not just done willy-nilly, it's done with care and with the help of finance and HR. Breath, breath. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean. Thank you, Teresa, for very nice and very informative uh, information. And thank you for what you're doing. I'm very familiar for the work that you do. And I enjoy uh, especially the event that you have provided and also volunteering for some of them. So I'm very happy to hear that you continue to, to move forward. Uh, I had a couple of questions. My question is, uh, the first one is on the capacity that you have in the, in the physical location. 
is already up to the limit or you think uh, you have more room to in include more seniors or more me more more programs? Yes. Uh, we have good space, for sure. Um, and in speaking with Rosanna Donahue, who is our activities coordinator, it's funny, this question came up last week. We could run as many as eight programs at a time using program rooms, board room, um, a, a lecture in, in the great room. Um, we have room, and uh, I would say we're active till about near 2 o'clock, typically because a lot of people rely on our transportation and it only goes till about three at the latest based on uh, the s staff capacity. Um, so the community life center is open and it, I think there's more room in the, the later parts of the afternoon. There's a lot of park and rec programs that go on in the evening. Um, so not so much council on aging, but more general community come in, come in the evening. In terms of council on aging, the, the programming is very robust. And then, but you go back to staff capacity. Um, Rosanna's full time working on activities. Her immediate supervisor is Kathy McCarthy, who split between per, uh, COA and Park and Rec. So they are, they're, they're working 150% with programming. But um, in terms of space available, yes, yes, there's, there's room for more. But I don't know that we are staffed, um, staffed well enough to be the people to do that. So you will say that we, we're providing services to the community in a very good number capacity. I mean, the community is being well served with the programs that you have right now as, so far. I believe that the council and that the seniors of the community are served well um, by us, very well by us. We even have wait lists, um, and so we try to rotate people to make things fair. Um, and uh, as far as the community life center is concerned, the community life center is the building. And uh, I know it's a goal of all of us to, to have robust programming there. Um, and so I would say many community groups use the building. They may not be programs of park and rec or COA, but we have the garden club. We've had uh, Eagle Scout ceremonies on Sundays. We've had um, Over the Rainbow come in for suppers at night. We have a drumming class. Um, we have in the past had yoga. So it's 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 pretty booked. Um, may not be every evening, but pretty robust. Would we like to see more groups coming in? Of course. Um, do we have the staff to oversee all of that? No. That's that's we be maybe an increase in the budget if that happened. Uh, an idea, I think, uh, you mentioned that the collaboration with Selling State is, 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 is in good standing, which is pretty good. But I would like to see uh, maybe more of the youth involved. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about collaborating with the Selling State public, public school so to bring some of the youth so they can maybe be involved with mm -hmm. our seniors and teach them how to contribute more into our society by giving them, and I think that would be a two-way benefit. Senior mm -hmm. would benefit from, and also the youth would benefit from. Do you, do you have any idea, I mean, any thinking on, into that maybe yeah. in the future? Sure, uh, and of course we would love that because the inter intergenerational experiences is, is pretty impactful. Um, up until a few years ago, we were working with the ROTC because of whoever their leader was at the time, I forget his name, um, was interested in working with us. And so we got the ROTC kids to do snow shoveling. And um, so that was fairly successful. It was, you know, making the match. Um, and then uh, I tapped them again, and they weren't, they weren't interested. Uh, we have looked into working with the schools, and I, I looked, uh, contacted groups like National Honor Society, uh, those kinds of, of groups. Um, we've not had a lot of success, uh, despite the efforts, but I think we can probably try harder, maybe make a meeting with leadership at the, at the uh, higher levels of, of the school department to do this kind of thing. Um, so it's certainly on the radar. We've done, you know, bits and pieces through the years, and I would love to do more. Um, occasionally, we will work with a particular classroom. Recently, um, 
It was just me. I wish the kids could have come, but I worked with a classroom from the Saltonstall School. They, they were just interested in different organizations in the community, and so they chose the Council on Aging. So I Zoomed with the teacher and the students. I think they were about seventh or eighth grade and told them all the facets of what we do in a way that they could grasp it. And they all had to um, write about it. And uh, so I saw some of the samples of the writing. And these kids, uh, the school is making a donation to the Council on Aging for like over $500, which is terrific. So that's a great partnership. But wouldn't I have loved them to be bussed over, you know? Um, we do uh, have the schools come. It's different than a project, and I think that's what you're thinking of. But we have um, the middle school and the high school courses and bands come probably two, three times a year, in particular around the holidays, and they entertain our seniors. We've had some drama groups come and do excerpts from their plays for the seniors as well. And we have had um, a few students doing their own study through, I don't know, whatever major, usually health sciences, and um, we've identified seniors where students can come and um, have one-on-one -on -one conversations. So we identify seniors who are willing to share their life story with the students. So we have done, you know, a bit, but I'd love to see something regular with the public schools or any school. Yeah, I have so many questions. I just want to limit it because of the time. I know some of my colleagues have some questions for you. But my last and final question is you refer to, uh, we, we maybe had that conversation before. It's on regard to the diversity, to bring more into the uh, the whole entire city, not only uh, one specific group, but uh, meaning like that. Uh, have you been increased the numbers of diversity in, 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 in the members that you lately serve? Slightly. Um, slightly more Spanish-speaking folks, and I don't have the breakdown for you, but I could supply that. Um, Rosanna Donahue, who is our bilingual staff person, has been pretty instrumental in reaching out into the community, along with our social workers, going out to housing, bringing samples of our programming. So we tell people, here's what you can experience at the Council on Aging at the Community Life Center. We can even provide transportation for you. Um, we do find that some people prefer to stay with their own ethnic-based, say, community house or community room. Um, I don't know that we can change all of that, but we always try to bring in, uh, you know, everyone. And again, it's a welcoming place. Uh, we do have um, a population of, of Filipino people who come every day and uh, participate in so much of what we do. And they share their culture, they share their food, um, and we always need to do more of this kind of thing and keep the outreach outreach going. We've had some luck with Charter Street. Um, there's a fair amount of Spanish-speaking people there. We tried to initiate a Spanish-speaking memory cafe, but it didn't take off. But we can try again. Great. Thank you. Councilor Merkel. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean, uh, and thank you for the great over. You really gave a great overview of everything going on there. Um, and uh, as your council liaison, it's been a pleasure to work with you over the last year. Uh, and I, I can speak to firsthand how impactful um, all all the programs are that you went went over. Not only attending myself, but I have friends that go to the uh, Memory Cafe. Uh, I have a neighbor that. That, uh, you, uh, really appreciates your caregiver support. So I, I appreciate the focus you have on the, the the crisis that a lot of people are in. You know, food insecurity, uh, their mental and quality of life, well being, uh, and also the fun factor because your events are a blast. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is the work with the friends on the Council on Aging. Uh, the budget before us would be higher without them. So uh, that's really appreciated uh, for for what they contribute to the to to what's going on there as well. Um, and 
Um, with the other thing I want to mention too are the efforts by the board to not only uh, I, I attend the board meetings and not only are they advocating for affordable housing but the, the conversations are how can we get more of our elder adults voting I mean how can we you know they, they're trying to think think of everything and to pre bring people in from around the city uh, like you said uh, and good luck with your grant thank you Council Cohen Thank you, Chair McLean. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm pretty sure we met when I served with you on the Leadership Council for Salem for All Ages. I want to do a shout out to uh, Mayor Pangalo and Pat Sato for mm -hmm. all their good work collaborating, yes. uh, bringing uh, diversity to that group. Mm -hmm. And uh, matter of fact, when uh, for many years, when uh, Council Prasniewski and I served on the then No Place for Hate Committee, Pat Zeta would come in and talk about um, that ageism is really one of the only accepted discriminations. Correct. And so one thing I just want to recognize th that you do, in addition to what you talked about, is how you bring dignity to so many people, because people being isolated or not feeling like they contribute to the community, um, you know, may may have lost some of their esteem. And just want to appreciate the way you've um, brought dignity to so many people. Well, thank you. It, it really takes a team, and we want to validate people and make sure they know that they're important and welcome. And in terms of Salem for All Ages, yes, we've worked closely. Um, over the years with with uh, Patricia and, and and Mayor Pangalo and uh, the, the great group um, to engage uh, more people. But that ageism group that kind of spun out of uh, Salem for All Ages is pretty significant. So this group gets together and discusses books that focus on ageism. And, and absolutely, it's been too accepted. So this group and all of us, we're, we're trying to combat that. It's a big thing in our, in our culture. So thanks for mentioning that. Council Marcelo. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm glad you brought up Salem for All Ages because I didn't see it anywhere in the narrative. And that really struck me that I was curious how you work together with them mm -hmm. um, with the programs. Okay. Well, typically I do mention them, and if I miss them, um, then I'm, I'm sorry that I did. Um, yes, it's been a, a partnership over the years, and I think primarily to try to uh, bring more people into the community life center, not just the Council on Aging. I mean, there's a big focus on seniors, but um, but to try to get people into the community life center. And uh, Salem for All Ages um, puts on a lovely speaker series um, over two seasons during the year. And that really helps bring, I think, a new set of faces into the center in the evening. And um, so, you know, that's not our program, but they're coming to the space and that's important and we support it. We help set it up, set up for that evening, that sort of thing. Um, we've been able to speak about our programs, taking a few minutes to um, encourage people to come. But, you know, it's, it's definitely been a partnership. And I think the, age, the ageism group right now seems to be um, taking off really well. Mm -hmm. But yes. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about mental health mm -hmm. in, in, elderly, um, especially after the pandemic, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, and I, I definitely have a concern with that. And I have a concern with the homebound population and caregivers of homebound people that are therefore pretty much homebound. Mm -hmm. And you, you did mention that you had this retreat. Um, but I really feel like that is a group that's missing in the city. Um, and so just kind of looking through your narrative here, you talked about, you know, collaborating with the community impact unit with concerns for the elderly, but that's like already too late. It feels like, I feel like we need to do more outreach for people who are homebound and not connected. Um, and I've spoken, you know, to the, to the uh, Salem for All Ages group about this too. Mm -hmm. That, And so I'm wondering if besides 
the ARPA funding for the kitchen, if you applied for any ARPA funding for programs, for mental health programs for the elderly, because I think that's missing too from ARPA funding. There, I think we talked about this with the ARPA presentation. Um, I think there's opportunities there and there's money there. Um, we still have money in ARPA. Um, I would love to see more, more outreach and more support services um, in the mental health area for elderly. Agreed. I mean, yeah. that's why I want, I'm planting the seed that we, we need, I think, a, a clinician going forward. And, yeah, and I wonder if the ARPA funds could help get that started now. That if, would be super. Yeah. That would be super. So I just need to be led in the right direction for that. Um, but um, yeah, certainly. Um, we had a two-year relationship with North Shore Community, Community Health Center. It was through a grant. And um, they were the lead, but we provided access and space for a mental health clinician to see seniors identified, referred by our social workers, then the pandemic hit. And seniors weren't too keen on doing telehealth. It wasn't that successful. But once we were back in person, it really took off. And so they sent a clinician a day and a half a week at, to the CLC. We gave space. And I think what was so good was that seniors felt more comfortable in a space that they knew, um, where they knew they could get a ride with us, um, they felt safe with that social worker who made the referral, and we had a, a terrific clinician. Unfortunately, at the end of the grant, their demands are so high, they had to pull her back. So that was just, gosh, maybe half a year ago now. And uh, so this is why this is so on my radar, because we've identified that this was successful and we need to do something about it. Yeah. So I would be happy to have discussions about ARPA funding for even a half time person to start yeah, yeah. okay um the um are you okay program mm -hmm. do you know how many people are registered in that not many yeah we've done a lot of outreach there's only like seven people it's successful for those people and we don't quite know why that's not successful um we've we've marketed it in various ways um it's been in the newspaper um i i'm hoping that we can get more people but it's it's it hasn't grown and it's kind of a dilemma for us but you know i'm thinking it's seniors sometimes think i'm all set i don't need any help but it's how to reach those family caregivers to say gee this would be great it would give me peace of mind mom or dad you know mm -hmm. kind of thing so a way to market that or maybe have some general publicity um coming from the community um that it's not just benefiting the seniors but the family yeah, I mean, I I don't think I've seen it on social media from the city that it's been restarted. I think there's a lot of opportunity here for mm -hmm. publicizing programs mm -hmm. from from your group. I, yeah, um, um, so many. Oh, I know. The last question is when your social workers go out to um, home visits, they do home visits. As needed. What if the residents are Spanish speaking? What do they do then? That's a good question. We've often had to have um, our activities coordinator um, translate. Um, and, I, you know, I can't tell you off the top of my head when that has been a challenge since I've been here, but we, um, we have used Rosanna to interpret with the person's permission, usually over the phone, though. The social worker will go out but it's pretty hard for her to leave. She has she works in a different capacity. And um, what I'm interested in is what Eileen was saying earlier in that service where you pay whatever it is per minute, because I think that would be very helpful um, as we work with various populations. So I hope that's something we can all look at, um, you know, to serve our folks better. Um, I, I did want to ask you um, about the about the transportation aspect of, of the work that you do. Um, mm -hmm. I was I want to make sure that I'm getting the proper picture of, of what's going on specifically with the van driver service. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at some of the lines here. Some of them appear to be reductions. Some of them appear to be positions that were requested that weren't filled. But I want to make sure I understand how that's relating to some of the grant funding. Uh, knowing that 
from the time that I served as liaison to the board that it, mm -hmm. there was there was some trouble attracting enough people to work in the van driving service and oftentimes what you pay people is what's determining whether you can get people so mm -hmm. um, are, are these real reductions uh, have we lost van drivers are we just seeking new people what, oh, what's the real story we, we lost one person and it was it's just being filled actually and um, some of their salaries are some are just funded by the city some are city and grant and some are just all grant <laughs> so it's it's how we can do it we're using the state formula grant for i think a few more this year there's a title three transportation grant that funds one person almost all the way and what's hard about van drivers is you can say okay uh, joe smith can work 16 hours a week um but oh my gosh, we have a demand and somebody's out and we need him for two more hours a week. And it's, we're juggling, you know, juggling a lot um, because we want to continue to serve our seniors. Um, so it's, it's kind of, um, there's a lot of moving parts with transportation, but as of late, we actually have attracted some folks, which is good, which is really good. We found some retirees who are, um, getting bored and wanted something to do, which was kind of neat. And, um, so that's great. But there was a gap. I mean, things go in cycles. And about two years ago, I uh, did a salary survey with neighboring councils on aging, and we boosted the pay a little bit. Now, it's not great pay, but it's kind of the going rate for, for the job, you know. Yeah. I mean, down the road, I would love to bring back, I guess, way before me, um, were a couple of full-time transportation folks with benefits. And I know that's a cost. But then you, it's a little bit more of a secure picture, too, you know. And so we'll look for other funding for that sort of thing. But I think if you give someone a full-time job with benefits, they're going to be committed and they're going to stay for a while. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes it takes a little money to get the quality. But overall, we have a really good transportation department, dedicated folks who really care about the seniors. Uh, we're curb to curb. We ask for a two-day notice. Uh, just because the planning piece, it's, it's, it's a moving target all day long. Um, but we have a, a great leader in transportation. And uh, again, it's such a service because it's creating access. Thank you. Seeing no further comments or questions, Council Rapworth. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, personnel budget in the amount of 559,296, expenditures budget in the amount of 116,750 for a grand total of 676,46. Councilor Hapworth moves to approve the Council on Aging personnel budget in the amount of 559,296, expenditures at 116,750 for a total of 676,046. Seconded by Councilor Merkel. Uh, I, should, I should add for the purpose of the record that Councilor Stott excused themselves shortly, uh, just after Councilor Merkel began her round of comments and questions. Um, we'll proceed to the roll call vote. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Watson Felt. Yes. And I am also a yes, so that is four in favor, and that carries. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Okay. Anybody need to point out anything that I missed this evening? Hmm? Just fine out. And the, uh, the only other item other than the finance department is the um, general fund transfers out, and those are on the agenda for tomorrow. And then, according to my tracking, everything else has a line through it so far. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, finance, I believe, is tab five. Um, so uh, briefly, uh, what does the finance department do? Um, our mission is to present a complete and accurate statement of the city's financial condition. Um, we're responsible for all financial and accounting activities in the city of Salem. Many of these activities are prescribed by Mass General Law um, and for the purposes of ensuring the fair assessment 
and um, collection of revenues and proper disbursement of funds in order to meet approved expenditures. Uh, I often say to folks, oh, we're really not trying to be difficult or a pain in the neck. We're trying to just make sure we're always complying with Mass General Law and keeping everybody out of trouble. Um, and these activities are guided by uh, city charter and ordinances as well. And also, of course, sound financial and accounting business practices. Additionally, um, we, of course, uh, I think our, our, our annual uh, big deliverable is, of course, the budget document uh, that um, is in front of all of you. Um, we're also the department responsible for assembling, um, you know, the capital plan component of that document as well. And just want to take the opportunity to give a huge thank you to the finance department team for their help uh, putting together the budget document this year. So Nick Downing, Justin McCutcheon, who's been here every night, um, Elizabeth Smith and Michael Walsh. Um, they're fantastic and I, I greatly appreciate them. Um, and also just a, a, a want to make a quick thank you to the all the departments uh, for all of their work on the budget as well. While I compile everything and spend a lot of time uh, doing that, they also spend a significant amount of time uh, being very thoughtful about their requests and going back and forth uh, with me and, of course, the mayor's office on, on all the details um, in their requests. So um, it's a huge collaborative process, and I'm super thankful for all of their work on, on this. Um, and also, of course, a huge thank you to the former act acting mayor and Mayor Pingalo for just all, all the guidance and all of this. Thank you. Um, in terms of goals and objectives, I don't believe this is in there, but um, after the, the committee um, meetings the past several days, one of my objectives is going to be to mitigate those duplicative lines because those are very frustrating to look at. And so I will get that fixed for next year. Uh, one thing that I have been working on this year and want to continue to do uh, with more um, sort of focus in the next year is improved fixed asset tracking and management. Uh, I've been working closely with Ray Joden a little bit on that. Um, our insurer offers a, a free service actually to help manage on the vehicle side. Uh, DPS does have a system that they use for repairs, but this helps manage like the life cycle and um, of, of vehicles and other assets. And so I want to dig in a little bit more on helping to make an even more robust capital plan while we look a year, a couple of years ahead um, with requests from departments. We, we're not really tracking a plan that sort of has our assets laid out somewhere with life cycle repairs in there and looking ahead to um, what those maintenance needs would be so that we can be very informed looking ahead of, oh, oh my goodness, in eight years, we need this many new, you know, these many fire trucks will be at, you know, kind of at end of useful life and, and these other vehicles in this building, et cetera. So that's one of my big goals. And related to that is also um, doing some significant debt affordability work, which I think will be very relevant uh, for the community in assessing um, next steps on the um, the uh, potential high school project, just so that folks can be fully informed about uh, whatever direction that takes, uh, what that would look like in terms of resources. So that is a, a big priority of mine to make sure that that information is available for everybody. Um, and then one last piece that I'm, I'm hoping to do is to wrap in some more of the personnel budgeting uh, that um, that you're seeing actually through our, our accounting system right now. It's all assembled manually every year when we do the budget. And so that can oftentimes lead to, um, to errors. There is a way to do that manually through our accounting system. And so I'd love to launch that piece potentially for next year. Um, and I think just to summarize quickly, not a lot of changes in the department this year, although some that will look significant. Um, the um, the contracted services line on expenditures has increased substantially. That is um, almost all related to moving the auditing and accounting line over from the mayor's office to the finance office so that all the expenses related to the annual audit by our external accounting firm, which currently is Powers & Sullivan, is in one place. This is also where we um, pay for our um, our actuaries to do the, um, the reviews that are required for accounting for our other post-employment benefits fund. So they will all be in one cost center. Um, additionally, the other um, other costs are related to COLAs and any salary survey adjustments that were made um, either during the year or are planned for next year. And I believe that those are the main changes reflected in the finance department's budget. What did I do? Something. Oh, in the contracted services, um, in the budget detail, there is a new line for the pattern stream budget platform tool. So that is the tool that is sort of an offshoot of our Munis accounting system where we are now able to do the budget in the accounting system. And then the pattern stream tool allows us me to then pull that data directly into all of the tables that comprise this budget book. So we set up all of these tables last year 
when we make changes in Munis, I can press a refresh button and it will repopulate all of these tables with the goal that uh, this investment is basically re significantly reducing the amount of staff time that is needed to put together the almost thousand page document <laughs> every year and providing more opportunities for discussing um, investments, you know, adjustments, more substantive conversations than just the administrative, you know, manually doing formulas in Excel. We are affording that by making some adjustments in what we're anticipating uh, for other contracted services, um, other contracted services that were higher in the previous years. We're not assuming the same usage going forward to afford that. And I think that's it for changes. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chairman Claim. How long you been in the in the position? If, if you um, two years and one month. Wow, because uh, the way you uh, professionally presented is very well. I just wanted to compliment you, Thank you. and your department for the way you had done the work uh, every year. That you know, this is going to be my sixth time, but I, this time I listening to you and your explanation and. The way you presented helped me a lot to understand most of the things that are going on. So thank you so much for your service. And I just wanted to bring that. No, thank you. You're very welcome. Compliments. Thank you. Council Merkel. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair McLean. And just thank you, as, as Councilor Dominguez said. Thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> thank you. Th no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank I you. mean, I, I, I do, I do have to say, you know, the, the gratitude I think is is apparent for for all of the work that you do, and it's it's not just in the preparation of this document. I mean, this is this is the output of all of the work that goes on, but the work that you do to find those efficiencies, to find those places where we can save money, to find the explanations, that that really makes a long di a long term difference that really accrues to savings for the taxpayers, right? It's not just the discussions that we have, it's the actual operational choices that we make and the insights that you have access to that we just won't have access to on this side of the table. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for the granular level that you take it to. Um, and, and I'm grateful for the clear attention that you pay to our feedback, right? You can see the difference year over year as we look at the book, even this year relative to last year, how you took some of our feedback and, and really incorporated it. So um, I can't echo enough my gratitude on, on top of what's already been offered. And you hear the phrase sometimes that, you know, you couldn't do it without you, but we really could not do this without you. So thank you very much for that. Mayor Pagalo. Thank you. Um, so, since I won't uh, be able to be here for tomorrow evening for the uh, for the council meeting, I just want to take this opportunity to kind of echo that, add on, uh, add on, and say that this was a, I think, a very challenging budget process with three administrations having some kind of involvement in it to some degree or another, and uh, wouldn't have been possible without Anna's leadership uh, throughout it and the, the support from her team in the, in the department, um, and uh, yeah, just couldn't do it without you and. and it, the extent to which uh, Anna is a, an essential part of uh, the city's operations isn't limited just to this budget. Uh, this is, you know, you see this, you see the council appropriation orders, but it's really a whole lot more than that as well. Uh, everything from uh, our uh, policy making decisions to what happens on the retirement board to what happens with uh, procurement to our ARPA uh, uh, efforts and before that CARES and <laughs> FEMA and, and all of that, um, our capital planning, all of it is. Uh, not possible without someone of your caliber and your professionalism, and I just wanted to put on the record to say we appreciate it. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, if we've handed out all our flowers, Councilor Hathaway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the finance personnel budget in the amount of 388 
four seventy. The expenditures budget in the amount of one thirty four fifteen for a total of five twenty two four eighty five. Councilor Hapworth moves to recommend approval of the finance personnel budget in the amount of three hundred and eighty eight thousand four hundred and seventy expenditures in the amount of one hundred and thirty four thousand fifteen for a total of five hundred and twenty two thousand four hundred and eighty five seconded by Councilor Merkel. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Watson felt. Yes. And I'm also a yes that is four in favor that carries. And I'll we'll take a final motion. Councilor Hapworth. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Councilor Hapworth, seconded by Councilor Merkel. Councilor Hapworth. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. Councilor Watson felt. Yes. And I am a yes. Four in favor. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So I'm actually the second oldest.